I'm Dave Reaver. For the next hour, we're going to be presenting to you on video some of the most bizarre and unbelievable things that we have ever presented through television efforts. In my lifetime, I've known some war, and in my lifetime, I have seen some of the bizarre. I've known suffering, but I've never known of the bizarre. I've never known of suffering like you're going to hear about in this video. And I certainly promise you this, it is war. I also think you should know that we accept responsibility for saying up front that what you're going to see and hear is terrifying. I do not want to be responsible for allowing children in the room who are not prepared for this. Parents, please pay careful attention and do as I ask. Please don't allow children to watch this video alone. Today, we are compelled to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. As people remember these experiences, they gag, they are nauseous, they, their, their entire body remembers what it was like to be there, to see this, to participate in this, to have this done to them. It's not a game. They really believe this. They believe Satan is on their side and they will hurt you. The rituals that we went through are horrendous, they're horrifying to anyone on the outside that even dares dream that something like this could take place. The darkness of Satanism is spreading rapidly today, especially among young people. We see the graffiti symbols everywhere, the evil influences bearing down on teenagers, in the music, and in their lifestyles. The dimensions of this phenomenon have become alarming. In this metroplex, uh, it's my estimate that there's approximately 40,000 practicing Satanists in the metroplex. That does not include pagan organizations, druids, Wiccans, which are of the uh, right-hand path of witchcraft, not the left-hand path. Dabbling in the occult and its various aspects in this metroplex would have to be over 100,000 individuals. Now, that's a conservative estimate. It's not going on in the schools to hear them tell, you know, they're wearing blinders. It's hard to get them to realize it's going on. Some, some te the teachers are more cooperative because they will call if they find notes or they hear something going on they will call us. Our department is getting more involved in the last eight or nine months because we've been getting calls from people that said we didn't know who to report these things to. There was like seven or eight large dogs, Dobermans, Shepherds, that had been killed and hung in a circle, their heads cut, blood drained, and the guy said, well, that happened six months ago, but we didn't know who to report it to. 85% of the teenagers in high school in Western Europe have been exposed to hardcore Satanism. That's an unbelievable figure. Here in America, I do not believe those figures are that high, but I would venture to say that 40% uh, of the kids. Most teens involved in Satanism are dabblers, they wear the clothes, try a few rituals, and listen to the heavy metal bands. But some go further. 
Of these, the self-styled Satanists can be the most dangerous. Because they never join a cult, they are unpredictable and volatile. Sean Sellers murdered a store clerk for a thrill, then his own parents. Richard Ramirez, convicted as the night stalker killer, worked alone in the name of Satan. It took the jury 22 days to find Richard Ramirez guilty of all 13 murders and 30 related felonies he was charged with. Ramirez declined to be present for the verdict. Thus ended the year-long trial of the Texas drifter accused of being the Night Stalker, the serial killer who once terrorized Southern California. All but one of the brutal murders took place in the summer of 85. The killer was dubbed the Night Stalker because he broke into his victims' homes and attacked them while they slept shooting, stabbing, beating them to death. In some cases, wives were raped after their husbands had been murdered. Victims were robbed, survivors forced to swear to Satan, and sometimes pentagrams, symbols of devil worship, were left behind, scrawled as their bodies. Fear spread throughout Southern California as the death toll reached 13. I'm very upset. It's frightening and I'm scared. Everybody is real edgy. We have uh, diligently tried to lock all the doors and windows. Gun sales doubled. A hunt was launched for the man in the police sketch. And Richard Ramirez was finally captured by an angry mob in an East Los Angeles Hispanic neighborhood. Hell safe. In court, Ramirez was defiant. A guard said Ramirez posted pictures of a victim in his jail cell, declaring there is blood behind the Night Stalker. Defense attorneys said Ramirez was a victim of mistaken identity, but witnesses and fingerprints tied him to the murders and ultimately sealed his conviction. Now the court will decide the fate of Ramirez, whether he's sentenced to death or life in prison. The man known as the Night Stalker has been sentenced to death in California. Richard Ramirez was convicted of killing more than a dozen people in 1985. Ramirez got his nickname because he often entered victims' homes at night, murdering people as they slept. In court today, Ramirez read a twisted and rambling statement. You don't understand me. You are not expected to. You are not capable of it. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. Legions of the night, night breed. Repeat not the errors of my father and show no mercy. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. That's it. Today's sentence means Ramirez could die in the gas chamber for his crimes, but it carries an automatic appeal. Self-styled Satanists are volatile and frightening. But what of those who join organized cults and become what is called traditional Satanists? Teenagers recruited into these cults are told of the thrills and untapped power they can achieve through Satan, and they are promised drugs and sex. But do they know what really awaits them in the end? Once they get involved with this, they don't get out because they've taken part in so many criminal offenses uh, that it, they can't just get up and walk away from it. The, they're, they're trapped by their actions and they're blackmailed into staying in. Another thing is that there's a good deal of... Uh, uh, power. It's an addiction. It's an addiction to evil. We all understand. Let's take it to the practical. For the public school uh, teachers and, and counselors that are watching, they understand addiction. They understand how an addiction will move from marijuana to cocaine. Uh, in my own family, we watched an addiction in, in my second son move from marijuana into a $700 a day cocaine habit that nearly killed him. He was putting IV cocaine in his arm 15, every 15 minutes during the day. And he didn't just start that way. And these people are into an addiction as well. They start by reading the Satanic Bible, start by a little candle magic. They start by the Ouija board and getting in touch with the spirit. And they become addicted to the power. There are no motion pictures that have come out that truly show what happens. They don't show the terror that is in the priest's eyes and in his mind. They don't show that same terror in the high priestess, nor in the participants. The power that is derived there. I met with a witch the other day, a high priest of the Wiccan craft of the craft. And he found out who I had been. And he said, he said, I probably, that's a problem I've got right now. He said, I, he said, I don't have the power to go against people like who you were. He said, 
Lord, he said, you people could light bonfires and never walk up to it. And I said, that's right. And he said, you could kill me with a thought. And I said, no, with a word. Is that right? I mean, yeah. That's the power that someone who has mastered, who has become an adept in the craft. Now, we're talking about a traditional Satanist, not a non-traditional idiot that is playing at this, but somebody that has made this their life's craft. Recently, Dave interviewed Dr. Bob Sloan, a psychologist who's dealing extensively with people trying to escape the terrible after effects of satanic involvement. Each sequence is drawn by a specific person, and I think the pictures illustrate the kinds of things we're talking about. Uh, the pictures are also drawn by the patient as they try to remember and try to recall what's happened. So drawing becomes a very important part of, of getting out and, and being able to firm up the puzzle that they're trying to put together. So they draw these pictures as a part of their recovery. As you can see here, there are certain steps that are followed. It's not a random kind of uh, thing that uh, they, they carry out on a whim. There are specific steps that they follow in preparing a small child to be initiated into the cult. They have to do this in this case because the child has been chosen. Oftentimes a baby is chosen for some reason to be the next leader of the clan. In this case, uh, there was a boy who was chosen, and his mother, who herself was a child who was chosen when she was a baby, who is now grown up, now she's an adult, she has a son, she's preparing him. As you can see, the elements he's considered special, and it's the, it's the combination, the introduction of pleasure and pain. Here you can see that she is introducing pleasure at the same time while she's doing that she's putting things, objects, uh, maybe a pencil, maybe, maybe a uh, heated nail or some other object that would create pain in him at the same time. As, the, as this awareness comes to her, she is in torment. As she, now, as she looks began, like she's tried to, to rub it out. Yes. There's, there's a part of her that said, I don't want to say this, I don't want to admit it. There's another part of her that says, yes, it's the truth, I have done it. How could I? I'm so bad, I'm so evil. My uh, night of baptism and initiation, I was initiated by fire, both physically and spiritual fire. And the spiritual fire is, they summoned a demon forth and it entered my body and set me on fire from the inside out that I might know discipline and the power of the covenant. And um, I've done it myself to other people. There are horrors that are unmentionables. That's why I say movie, motion pictures can't hold a candle to it. If you will, imagine the young man that was taken off the streets of Matamoros. He would have been mutilated slowly, that his life force not leave him quickly, but slowly as to increase the frenzy of the sorcerer committing the act. So the greater the pain, the greater the suffering, the greater cries that he gave out, the greater the power derived from his life force leaving his body. That's the belief. Some of Dr. Sloan's patients also speak of the terrors of Satanism. These pictures were drawn by adults remembering things they had long ago repressed, things done to them as children when they had been forced to take part in cult rituals. The following is but one example of a Satanic sacrifice. This is a, a typical kind of ritual uh, which involves the kidnapping of children. And uh, in this case, you can see this ritual ceremony took place in a barn here, are the bales of hay. It's an old barn. And in this case, you can see the, the cauldron, the boiling cauldron, the altar, the gold knives, all the elements are here, the, the robed members of the cult. Uh, in this case, the victim is a child, four or five years old, and uh, the, the cult victim who drew this picture was still a child. And the sacrificial victims were, in this case, two, a brother and a sister who had been kidnapped. And uh, they had been seduced. And at this point, she reports that they weren't really scared. 
They'd probably been taken off of a playground somewhere and said, we're going to go have a birthday party or something. So they weren't scared. They're brought in ages uh, about seven. You can see the cult leader here. Um, these children are tied onto the altar. And there's also the beginning of bloodletting. So they've cut the boy some. He's starting to cry, and she's crying, because they, they realize now it's happening, of course, and there's screaming. It, it starts to happen. Um, the member of the cult, the child member of the cult, of course, is watching. She's very scared. She's reporting, and she's remembering that they made her do this and how bad she feels about it. But she can't help it. She's four. These are adults. She's a victim in this process. Um, as this ritual proceeds, you can see that there begins to be a lot of blood. Uh, you can see that the, the boy here is then cut open, again, along his chest, ripped apart, his organs taken out, and then he's dismembered. You can also notice that the little girl has lots of little cuts, and she's bleeding pretty profusely here from her groin area. So there's beginning to be a lot of screaming, a lot of blood, uh, dismemberment and preparation for uh, the cannibalism. You can also pick up in this drawing the worship nature of this. Right. This is not just an event. This is a, a worship service that builds to a frenzy, builds up to a peak. Um, and this, of course, is, as this person wrote here, preparation for the human stew. Here, the brother is dismembered. He's already gone. He's in the stew. And the, the child, a uh, member of the, the cult, then herself is uh, brought up to participate more. The adult leader is cutting the, the little girl and killing her, ultimately, as the, the child uh, member um, inserts other objects into the little girl. The element that's not really seen here but written in is the uh, sexual abuse that always precedes the bloodletting. The members of the cult all sexually abuse um, the victims before the torture and the mutilation This begins. is where the power of pornography in our society begins to play its role. It's, it's the introduction of the bizarre that, that pornography begins to be a, a venting and a letting of urges and once it starts, it's never satisfied. And pornography is just the introduction. It's the little door to open to the mind. Well, pornography, of course, is an addiction. And pornography, sexual stimulation, it stimulates the same part of the brain, the pleasure center, that cocaine stimulates. It's addictive. Um, and, of course, sexual stimulation and the unfettered expression of sexual fantasy is a part of all no, of this. Absolutely not. Anything goes. The, as you know, the satanic theology is the reverse of Christian theology. Love is bad. Uh -huh. Life is, is bad. Good. Hate is good. Death is good. So there's the kind of the, the breaking down of any limits on fantasy and imagination and what the theology of Satanism does is uh, says no holds barred and evil is Good. expressed evil is good that's their that's right. their role there are scores of painful stories like these from people who have lived a hellish nightmare one of dr sloan's patients tells of having to watch an actual crucifixion conducted at easter time when coven leaders kidnapped a young man nailed him to a cross mutilated him branded him with irons and then threw him alive into their bonfire one victim tells of being forced to help in a torture and sacrifice of his own mother I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. And I'm gradually getting better about being able to laugh and have joy in my life because I hurt inside a great deal. Uh, many times I think about things that I did and what I have done to other human beings. This is not a pleasant thing at all. It's very disturbing. I know that the Lord has forgiven me, and my problem is, is can I forgive me? And I know that I have to, and that's the fact that I live with. I do, and I'm getting better at it. And I have a wonderful, wonderful wife right now who's very loving and very understanding, and who has a deep understanding of 
the occult and Satanism from what I have taught her, but an understanding from the viewpoint that a Christian should take towards it, a caring, a loving attitude. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I don't know exactly how I would deal with it today. You know, for years, police officers have had to deal with kids getting hooked on drugs and going bad over a period of uh, a relatively short period in the life of a child, maybe uh, three to six months, something like that. A kid can go from being a straight-A student to being a um, absolute uh, disgrace. And uh, what we find in occult groups are that a child can go from being uh, perfectly normal, well-adapted, uh, well-thought-of, to being a total um, waste in, in a shorter period of time as a month and so frequently when we get involved in these things it's because they have gone off the deep end in such a short period of time. Have you seen some of these people come out of this? What are you seeing with some of these people now? Where are they in their development? We're seeing people uh, in the process of uh, we've seen a real spiritual sensitivity with these people. Uh, they know there's a spirit world. They're very sensitive to that. And they, because they're with us, they've committed themselves to, uh, to healing and uh, a change in their life. It's a long, torturous process. It is not a quick fix. How can you do this to a child? A few people that have tried to pull themselves out of a group like this are traditionally females who are tired of giving up their children for sacrifice, something like that. But traditionally, the men don't get out very often. Uh, we do see uh, situations where the uh, kids get in, but because of free sex and drugs and the power and so forth, they ended up getting in over their head, and then they can't uh, pull themselves out either. Dr. Bashir Ahmed is a psychiatrist dealing extensively with young people caught in Satanism. Here he gives a profile of the typical recruit. The kids who have difficulty at home, who are coming from dysfunctional families, where the bond between parents and children almost non-existent, these children are easily lured to the fantasy world, which they like it. They most probably like to read about magic stories, fantasies, and they begin to live in this world. And when they see an opportunity to experiment something like this, they become very impressed. For example, uh, for a 13-year-old going at midnight to a cemetery, it's a lot of excitement. Uh, his heart is beating very fast. He doesn't know what is going to happen. Um, he has some fear. A non-traditional Satanist uh, stemmed from anyone who might have a low self-esteem about themselves, someone that is an underachiever, is not an overachiever, someone who is not charismatic in their attitude. Most normally a child that is been turned off by school, been turned off by his friends, Satanists will approach him and they'll woo him in because they will become his best friend. And after they get him, he's hooked. Satan is at his most deceptive when he appears to be good. Such is the case with many of the occult practices in southern Louisiana. There, the tree tours, as they are called, are famous for their peculiar blend of magic, potions, folk remedies, and diluted elements of Roman Catholicism. We visited one tree tour who tried to explain some of his rather confused methods. The power is written in the Bible. The verses of the Bible has been given, and uh, no matter where you take, what part you take in the Bible, Jesus said that he He's given power to all. These candles are for if somebody's sad, somebody have tears, and they keep hearing things in their home. The spirit is not resting. And it's very simple to, to cure someone with epilepsy. Somebody that falls in this in a, in these kind of fit, take your little needle, a needle, and hold his finger and just stick it just enough to draw blood, not stick it all the way we hit bone, just enough to break the skin. 
take a little bit of that his blood and put a little sugar in water and make him drink of his own blood. Just a little bit, about nine drops of blood. New Orleans, bustling city on the Mississippi with a rich and colorful history. Famous for its lively French Quarter, jazz, unique dining, and voodoo. Though most voodoo practitioners live in the swampy backwaters of lower Louisiana, some have set up shop in the French Quarter. One of the most famous voodoo houses is owned by Chicken Man, who recently granted us an interview. He turned out to be more promoter than magician. Why do they call you the Chicken Man? Well, I'm the voodoo king of New Orleans, and uh, I do my, my voodoo rituals out in the bayou on my island. I use live chickens and live snakes. What kind of rituals do you do, or what is it supposed to do? Well, my rituals is uh, mainly I do those for healing and, and uh, helping people, not hurting. That's the main purpose. And um, I do a lot of it, use a lot of it for uh, keeping the kids off of drugs. You know, drugs is getting real bad now. Well, what kind of rituals do you do for drugs or that? Explain just some of the rituals a little bit. Well, I get pieces of seeds from the, from the bayou. And at night, we do our rituals put all the seeds in a, lot, in, a, in a big circle. And while the drums are playing, we put energy into those seeds. And uh, I pass them out to the kids to carry in their pocket. And when they, they think about going on drugs, they, they put that seed in their hand. Not all Louisiana tree tours stay with the good magic, however. Ferenberg, a pastor who continually confronts their oft-feared work, explains black magic. I have a man in the church right now that when he first started coming, this man was blackmailing him that if he didn't pay him so much a month that he was going to put hex and voodoo on him. And this man was in such fear that I literally had to tell this man to tell that man if he did it again, I was going to the DA's office. That's what I'm saying. If the people stand up and let these people know that they're, not, they're going to be exposed, this man quit blackmailing this guy when I threatened to go to the DA with it. Law enforcement officials are just now beginning to learn about cult crime and how to investigate satanic rituals. The slaughter in Matamoris helped to awaken the nation to a growing nightmare. Matamoris is not finished. It's the beginning. It's the tip of a very, very large iceberg. And we're going to hear more of Matamoris. And the lady that was um, taken into custody who she claims that she had no foreknowledge of these events and she did not participate, I would venture to say she fits the exact profile of being the high priestess of this cult, as well as being the one in complete authority and in charge, not the Godfather. He was under her direct command. I think that our authorities here in the state of Texas have somewhat downplayed and may have missed the boat with her. The Mexican authorities have not missed the boat. They have her keyed in exactly who she is. And it's up to the authorities here to listen to them, pay attention to what they're saying. One Mexican, Mexico authority down there uh, stated that she exhibited three distinct personalities, one of which is this kind, uh, sweetheart, all-American girl attitude. Another one of that she exhibited is one that growls and bites and kicks and spits. Uh, she exhibits a third one that exhibits tremendous authority and power. That's why I say she probably is. She exhibits the type of uh, personality, uh, the type of demeanor and so forth of uh, an individual that would be in power. People don't want to believe the unbelievable. Vicki Caldwell has been investigating cult crimes for the sheriff's office in Putnam County, Florida, and during the past few months has noticed an increase in activity among satanic groups. I got arrested about four years ago because a friend of mine up in Ohio, her son got involved and he tried to kill himself and kill his parents. And so I've been studying it since I came with the department. It's been about a year and a half. I have noticed an increase around here with the teenagers. What kind of things do you see? Uh, most of your self-styled Satanists, your dabblers, drugs, heavy metal music, role-playing games, animal mutilations. In August of 1986, we had a double murder in which two teenage Parkers were found shot quite a number of times in a rural parking lot of a uh, development which was going up. Uh, at the time of that investigation, we became 
acquainted with a term called Dungeons and Dragons, and as part of that investigation, we got involved in some of the occult investigations also. Well, part of the problem, number one, is understanding what they're up against. Uh, they have pagans, witches, traditional and non-traditional Satanists, as well as uh, skaters. They have uh, skinheads, freaks, pops. They've got everything under the sun that they're not truly understanding the relationships between each and every one of them, as well as which are criminal and which are not criminal. Who's violent, who is not? Who can be expected to turn violent? Uh, someone necessarily calling themselves a Satanist isn't necessarily so. It's a, it's a new era for law enforcement, just like when drugs started, it was new. Computer crime is new. People are starting now to realize that there is something else out there. A lot of cases are being reopened because of that. Well, I've been a police officer for 15 years, and probably during that entire 15 years, I have seen things which we now label as ritualistic in nature, but never recognized it. One young woman's body was found, what appeared to be a brutal rape case that culminated in the stabbing of the victim, was left by law enforcement agencies that way, with no further clues. However, upon her chest was Z-E-N across her chest in her own blood. It made no sense to them. It made no sense because they're not Satanist. That Z-E-N is the name of a demon, and his name is not Zen, by the way. It is Zod-N, Zod-N. And that demonic entity is who she was sacrificed to. And had they known that, it would have led them in the direction of searching for a Satanist. The most frightening fact of all is that Satanists today have encroached into every level of society, a dangerous and unseen force. Lawyers, politicians, um, police officers, and this is very shocking at how many police officers, how many officials are actually practicing Satanist. And this is one of the other problems that we have in dealing with the crimes, is the crimes themselves are snuffed out. They're, they're hushed up. Or if a crime is known to be in progress, it's very difficult to get anybody to respond to it because of things that are blocked within the judicial system. By Satanists? By Satanists. These people are in every strat of society. We're talking doctors, we're talking lawyers, we're talking a lot of Christian ministers who preach a sermon perhaps on Sunday morning and are involved in satanic rituals the night before. We're talking elders and, uh, and Sunday school superintendents. I, I'm, I'm mentioning the cases that I am aware of. Uh, and as you, you've studied this yourself and read the literature, you know that uh, people at every level and every profession, uh, successful business people, um, psychologists, doctors, law enforcement people uh, are involved in this kind of thing. It's, uh, it's unnerving. We've had notes written about uh, Satan on walls in schools. You know, that my God's better than your God and all this. We had one note, you're welcome to a bloodbath ritual. I'll be there at 1154 for the, it's over for the gatekeeper of hell to appear. Bring your set clothes or black sheets. This is what's going on in basically the schools. Usually, it's very secretive. As far as the kids go, you know, they don't know anything. They haven't done anything. Parents usually think, my kid's just going through a, you know, a phase. Invited to a party.
In the beginning, Satanists will entice a recruit with these three promises, power, drugs, and sex. Most teenagers recruited into Satanism are boys, drawn by the violent images and rituals, and by the fear they can cause in others. Yet without heavy involvement in drugs, most of these recruits would not be able to go on. Most of the time, like I said, there's drugs involved. Just because you're taking drugs does not necessarily mean you're into Satanism. But nine times out of ten, Satanists are into drugs. I have not seen in my practice any uh, adolescent who have gone to the cult activity without using drugs. As a non-traditionalist begins to get deeper into drugs, and more and more deeper into his known craft and seeking after the powers, he loses sight of reality completely. You're no longer dealing with human beings as you and I know them. Yvonne Peterson tells this tragic story of one girl who committed a heinous crime in the name of Satan. And I think parents need to hear this, that uh, she needed somebody to talk to and her parents were too busy. She was the oldest of six, and she was their babysitter, their dishwasher, and their house cleaner. And they didn't have time for her. I'm going to call her Diane for the book, okay? And um, that's not a real name, but she was a very intelligent, pretty little girl of 12 years old. She went to a party, and she met a young man, which we'll, we'll call him Steve, okay? He's 16. And Steve told her he would listen to her, and he would pay attention. Now, this is, this is not fiction, and this isn't something I read in a book. I sat with this little girl as she cried her eyes out, as she walked through the memories of the past two years, uh, the things that she had had done to her and had had to do to other people. Uh, he told her, I'll listen to you, and he gave her a marijuana cigarette. And they went outside and sat under the tree, and they talked. And then he began to tell her how, how pretty she was and how much he needed to be around her and how fascinating she was. And all he did was, it was show love and attention, which every teenager in America craves from their parents. And, and so if they're not did. there, then those say, well, the average, age, the average time a father spends with his kids is three minutes a day. That's sad. Three minutes a day. That's incredible. And... Uh, so he told her, I'll, I'll, Steve told Diane, I'll take care of you, you know, we'll be boyfriend, girlfriend. And they developed their relationship over the next six months. He also developed her drug habit because now she was hooked on cocaine. Okay, at the end of the six months, he told her that he was a Satanist priest and that she was being recruited and that she would be initiated into his coven of, of Satanists. She kept a diary. At one point, she said, where has that innocent child gone? Will I ever know her again? Speaking of herself. Her tragic notes all throughout her diary, both of her spiritual bondage and her physical bondage to the addiction. And she said she would lay in bed at night and she would hear them chanting and calling her back to the circle. And then on August the 1st, three years ago, she was led into a cemetery. And if I might have your permission, I'd like to read from her hand the memories of that night. Uh, please do. I found out that we were having our cult ceremony in the cemetery. That wasn't as shocking as when I found out that Steve and me were going to be married into the cult. Anyway, it was fantastic. The moon was perfectly round and it wasn't even cold. By the black candles, which were primarily used for light, we went through the ceremony of eternal slavery to each other. We cut our tongues and we let the blood pour into each other's mouths. It was nirvana. We were one, one blood, one being. Rosalie passed the sacred vial around and we performed the ritual of extending ourselves. Bright colors and lightning flashed streaks through the sky. Sometimes the colors exploded like rockets on the 4th of July, both in and out of our head. When the chanting started, they brought in a little baby. He was barely walking, tied him to a nearby tomb. It was crying. After it was tied down, Chris took out his sacrificial dagger. I held back the baby's head while he cut it from the base of its neck down to its waistline and across the stomach. The baby was still alive, so I broke its neck by just about twisting it off. I hate myself so bad now. I helped in the killing of a baby. Animals made me sick enough and made me feel quite horrible. But a baby, my God, that was someone's child. I know now that I am truly horrible. No punishment I have ever had in the past could even begin to measure the type of punishment I need. I wish it could have been me they killed. My life isn't worth anything anymore. 
I've taken away someone's right to live. She's 14. And I mainlined with Satan uh, when I was 21 years of age. And I came out at age 28, but I was a Satanist high priest for four years. Now, during that particular time period, I remember very little as far as details are concerned. I don't remember even graduating from high school, although I know I did. Why don't I remember it is the fact that drugs were involved and the need to escape, the need a person has to have to escape the realities of what they have been involved in. And I took what I called clean drugs. They were pharmaceuticals. Not that it really matters any, but I was hooked on Percodan, Valiums, Librium, and just plain alcohol. I would take an average of uh, 60 to 80 milligrams of Valium in a day's time with about 40 milligrams of Percodan and wash it all down that night with two or three vodka Collins. I was a functional addict. Drugs, sex, power. These are the enticements Satanists use to lure teenagers. Another is music, specifically heavy metal or black metal. I think music has always been a powerful media, all the way through. I mean, music was important to you and me, and, and it's important to the teenagers today. And we're not anti-heavy metal, but we're anti the heavy metal message that is causing death and destruction. And the symbols that they're using are so blatantly occultic uh, that it's very difficult for us to overlook that kind of thing. For instance, if we take uh, the album uh, cover from Slayer's album, Rain and Blood, uh, it depicts a message to young people that maybe consciously they don't receive, but subconsciously they're receiving this message. On the front of this album cover, uh, Satan is depicted as a goat, which is very familiar to the Satanists. They know that that would be the goat would represent Satan. And he is seated on a wooden throne. And the throne is being supported by two people. Now, in the hand of this goat is a decapitated head. And, of course, we're finding decapitated bodies all over America. And um, that is a common way for a Satanist ritual to occur is to do the decapitation. And so he's holding this decapitated head, which emphasizes the bloodletting ritual and the murder. And then the throne is, is lifted up and being carried on the shoulders of two men. The man in the foreground is wearing a mitered hat, which we know to be the hat of a pope. And so that man represents organized religion or the church. Behind him is another man who is carrying the throne of Satan, not only on his shoulders, but across his neck, like the stalks would have him in bondage. And that man has horns and a forked tongue. And when you look at that, you think, oh, this is one of Satan's demons. And yet, if you look carefully, his hands are very prominent in the picture, and they have nail marks in them. And the only man depicted throughout history with nail marks is Jesus Christ. And so what this thing is saying to them is that Christ and the church will support the rise and, of Satanism and in addition to that, then there's a sea of blood that is flowing into a huge sea below Satan. That All the faces are down in the sea that he has taken captive and, and have become his victim. And the very fore, the, in the forefront, there is a face that if you take that face and put it up against the face of George Washington, you'll see that they're almost the same. I mean, they're so identical. And so what we're saying here is that Satanism is going to take over our country and that it is going to be brought in and supported by Christ himself and the organized church. That is blatant uh, evangelization and propaganda being, sh being shared with uh, thousands of young people through music. I think the greatest tool to desensitize America has been uh, media in general, whether it is television, whether it's toys, games, or whether it is music, they all have played an important part. They all carry a message, don't they? Absolutely. And of course, in the life of the teenager, the two single most factors that we see um, is music and a game called Dungeons and Dragons. And then, of course, trailing very closely behind that and vying for the position is the amount of occult information that is put out through um, the videos, the movies, the TV shows. We went into a very small store, David. This was, I mean, maybe 
as big as we're sitting here. This was a small set. We found 119 videos on the occult in one small store. And we have a video in America that is on our shelves that has been banned in 46 countries. And it was so popular, it has faces of being one, two, three, and four. And in that video, it shows everything that is gruesome, grotesque, everything that you would never want to see or hope your child would never see in the way of death scenes, including some decapitation occult rituals. Parents should be alert to the warning signs that show their kids are involved in the cults. Besides the music, there are the clothing, jewelry, and symbols used. There is the classic pentagram, worn inverted by the Satanist, the broken cross or peace sign, the inverted cross, the horn hand sign, the goat's head, the 666 sign, and many others. In addition to symbols, watch for involvement in occult games like the Ouija board or in dark role-playing games. I would tell them, especially the parents with the young people, this is not a phase. Know what your young people are, are doing. Talk to your young people. Communicate. Don't fluff it off. Check everything. There's nothing wrong with asking them where they're going, what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with checking out their music and books they're reading. The parents need to care and communicate. Satanists entrap young people in several ways. At sex parties, they take snapshots of their victims for use of blackmail, or they'll involve the unsuspecting victim in their darkest rituals, perhaps animal or human sacrifice. They will get the teenager to offer his blood or even a finger to Satan. Blackmail and even outright threats keep a teenage victim in line. Some victims see suicide as their only escape the tragic legacy of Satanism. The message I like to give to parents is that be close to the children. Understand them, talk to them, communicate with them. Uh, always find a time where you will make a point to go to in their room or sitting in the living room and talk about their school, their friends. 10 to 15 minutes each day is more than enough. Although Everybody will surprise. 10, 15 minutes, that's all you're asking? Yes, because they don't talk even five minutes in weeks. So 10 to 15 minutes. That's first thing. Second thing is that at least once in a month, try to have a family gathering, not extended family, just three, four children, have a picnic or go out somewhere. Half an hour, one hour. It gives them a feeling of belonging, a relationship. In addition to the personal involvement parents can have in their kids' lives, people can also work against Satanism at the community level. Many schools and organizations now offer seminars on Satanism. Some communities have gone even farther than that. Recruitment is a major part of Satanism, but it's one of the most instantly denied things. By... And yet it's such a problem that even on our public school campuses, now school boards are having to take direct action against it. I'm reading from the Carl Sandburg High School 1989-1990 Student Parent Handbook. On page 29, it deals with policy, and I want you to hear this. The Board of Education hereby finds that the presence of Satanism and related activities has surfaced in society and that such practices, when present or urged upon other students, cause material interference within a public high school district in that such practices foster anti-social values and attitudes and endangers the health, safety, and welfare of students. Carl Sandburg High School is the number three school academically in the United States. It's in Chicago. Now listen, no student shall engage in any Satanism-related uh, activity, including, but not limited to the following. Number one, soliciting others for membership in any satanic group or participation in any satanic related ritual or practice inciting other students to act with physical violence upon any other person or living thing thirdly they are not permitted to wear use distribute display or sell any clothing jewelry emblem badge sign or other item which is commonly associated with the affiliation with or practice of Satanism. What I'm trying to say to you is these three areas of recruitment 
high school campuses, military bases, daycare centers. I'm most obviously connected with, first, the high school campus, and then secondly, the military base. My point, though, is that so much activity is now taking place that school boards are having to enact policies in how to deal with it. This isn't relegated to the big city of Chicago only. Here's something you should see from a town in our community, Arlington, Texas. Well, this Halloween, you might see a scarecrow in the halls of Arlington schools, but you won't see kids wearing scary costumes. The school district is banning skulls, witches, brooms, and the like because of parent concerns that some Halloween costumes can be linked to devil worship and satanic cults. Channel 4's Ken Caps has more on that story. Playful screams on Arlington playgrounds mean back to school and recess. But there won't be any shrieks or screams by these kids clothed in goblin garb this Halloween. Ghosts and skeletons and other scary characters are expelled. And when you see children in elementary levels coming with Freddy Krueger and their fingers have the knives or whatever he has and the grossness of the costumes, we thought we can do better than that. Atherton principal Shirley Cole has her kids decorating a school display area with pressed leaves and a stuffed scarecrow. Autumn, not Halloween, will be emphasized. Kids in Arlington will still dress up on October 31st, but they'll be playing the parts of their favorite book characters. October is book month. Which will do two things. It'll give those children an opportunity to dress in costume, but it also will encourage them to read. Satan exacts an agonizing toll in the lives of those who are trapped and in the lives of those who help them escape. Yet those we have interviewed expressed a profound hope for those who want to escape. If you have your rehabilitation and your counselors, but it's going to take something stronger in some of these cases. And a good old-fashioned prayer meeting won't hurt anything. There's hope for me. There's hope for everyone. I don't care what the situation. So the number one importance is the cohesive relationship among the family members. Then the kid who has some belief in God, I think he's much more protected. Because there's a God and because there's a cross, there's hope. And that's not a second-handed um, hope. I had a choice to make, and I chose life. I knew I was about to die and that I was going to hell. What the Satanist is looking for in the, in the long term, he's looking for God. He's looking for that thing that he can worship. And until he finds it, until he gets reconciliation with what he's looking for, then there is no freedom. Recently, my brother asked me the question, he said, where was Satanism when we were kids? Why didn't we get into it? Why didn't we know about it? It really is a more recent phenomenon on the social life of the students and the kids of America. In looking at what you have just seen, consider it. Remember what's been said. Remember the people. They're everyday people. Many of those people never intended to ever be sitting on a television stage or set and talk about Satanism. We've done our best in researching these people to qualify both their character and their claims. We believe in them, that they've been honest with you and with us. I've asked my brother to join me and give a few of his thoughts on what he's seen. A man I hold in great esteem. He's general manager of this corporation, and when we went into this thing together, we didn't go into it foolishly or with some kind of entertainment in mind. We went in with a cause. Al Reaver, Thank I'm you, glad you're with me. <clears throat> Actually, I went into this, my part of it with fear and trembling because there's a fine between glorifying something that you really are only trying to give information on and, uh, and just giving information. And I, I feel like that our television department has done a good job in, in staying on the right side of that line. I'm sure that there are some who have watched the video and they have a question in the back of their mind and they're saying to themselves, does this prove the existence of Satan? Well, see, we're not, well, that's not the question that we were approaching. That's not what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to prove anything. Yeah. What we were trying to do and I feel have accomplished is we have shown that Satanism is very real. The consequences of Satanism 
are very real. There are really hurting people because of the presence and the activities of Satanism. Now, where a person goes with that is something that they're going to have to deal with internally. They're going to have to ask themselves some very serious questions. But the signs, the evidences, the things that are going on around, and especially on high school campuses, things that I've seen where normally I, I just drive onto a school campus, you know, and let my teenager out and drive off. The other day I drove onto the campus and I looked over and under a tree was a large group of young people, all of them, every single one of them dressed in black. And I thought, there's no reason for that unless, you know, and then it clicked. There's probably something going on. Did you know, Dave, I watched it over a period of days, and one day as I drove by, I saw two boys there fighting. Everybody just standing there, look, just grinning. And, and when I say fighting, I don't mean just kind of hugging and rolling around in the dirt. One of them was holding the other one's jacket over his head and was kicking him in the stomach. It was, it was vicious, it was cruel, and it went exactly in line. I slowed down, almost came to a stop to see if there was anything to do, and he let the boy go, and the boy took off running. But just to see and know what is happening on our high school campuses ought to put the fear into people and enough to start to take some action. Well, our campuses are beginning to be more violent than they've ever been. There's more at stake than there's ever been. Uh, I think today we have, through this video, shared with you what we see as the trends, some consequences. I don't think we're prepared for it in America. We don't have all the answers. I don't know if we gave you enough answers to really help, but at least we have tried to do something to bring an awareness of what many people, especially those on the fringes of Satanism, are denying exists. They're saying there is no such thing. Ask those families of 15 dead people in Matamoros. Ask the families of the Night Stalkers victims. It's very real. Are you prepared for it? I'm Dave Reaver. Thank you for being part of this program today. Young girl in a strange new world of power and deceit. All the sex and highs of controlling life seem so exciting. But now she's one month two with the baby boy. In dealing with the child trafficking situation, now you did relay to me some information, uh, you know, that you were able to see uh, from an inside standpoint uh, of the CIA's knowledge of, uh, of various uh, traffickers of of children and and, 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 and where they're located. I, I mean, can you really just talk about that a little bit? What you saw? I mean, from an inside standpoint, so people can really get a picture of this. Some, uh, some information and some, you know, some, some, some computer sheets, if you will, looking at a big computer board. And, uh, you know, and, and I came aware of a couple of things. One, um, slavery is at an all-time high right now around the world. It's, it's probably greater or, or at least tied for the greatest of, of, of any other time in the history of the world. That's slavery. We don't realize that because we keep on thinking slavery is a bunch of people on a farm being whipped somewhere. But nevertheless, uh, the CIA is involved in it. It was the Army's job, uh, and uh, some of the information I got from them was to track some of this stuff that goes on. Okay. And children are moved all through the United States, they're moved through Mexico, and they're moved for a number of reasons. Some of them are for sexual reasons. 
Some are for pedophilia reasons, but some are for satanic reasons, and those are those people will be sacrificed. Um, at various things that go along around the world, and uh, their network of underground is very good, and in fact, uh, they protect these interests very good from local police and local authorities. Stop for a second. I want you to say it one more time. Are you saying that this the CIA? actually protects some of these individuals from the local authorities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. Right now, we're out in the graveyard, and we're here for a particular reason because I want you to see that this whole thing about the occult is not a joke. Now, according to some research that Captain Uriah did, if you watch that video that we did with Captain Uriah dealing with 9-11 and the occult, according to his research into the occult, in their literature, they believe that occult energy emits from the very front gate of a graveyard. And so if you want to set up a house in which you're going to have occult practices taking place, you're going to want to set that house up directly in front of the front gate of the graveyard. And not just directly in front of the front gate, but you're going to want, the, you're going to want that front door of that house to be directly in line with the front gate of the graveyard. Now I want you to see this because this is this is some pretty shocking stuff. Now we're taking a little walk through the graveyard here, right? Now here's the front gate of the graveyard, obviously. I want you to take a close look at this house that we're getting ready to go up on. Come on. Now, if you get a look at this, this is some pretty sick stuff. I don't know if you can get a close up on those windows there. They have black curtains covering every window here. Some really sick, sad and black curtains up there. Looks something looks like something straight out of a vampire movie. We got black coverings over these windows here and they have plexiglass on the windows. So it's not glass that you can just break with a stone or something here. Now look at this stairwell. And notice the basement has no windows. Everything stone. Alright? So if you're going to want to get out of this place, you're going to have to jump from at least the second floor here. But anyhow, let's go up the stairwell here. Alright, let's see if anybody's home right in the back. Now just in case you might think that this place is abandoned, it's not. There's somebody that comes here every day. They take the mail out of the mailbox. As you can see, the lawn is groomed, it's manicured, the whole place is taken care of. But there are people that come here ever so often, and then those two lights will be on here. You'll see a light on here, and then you'll see a light on in this window over here. And according to uh, some sightings, it might be uh, late at night, there'll be limos that'll pull up here, and the police will block off the street, and nobody can come in because you know they'll give them some you know some stupid reason but there's obviously activity going on here all right now obviously nobody's coming um, coming here now let me just let you get a look at something you might want to even go down there as I come down because I want everybody to uh, get a look at this now Right now, I'm directly in front of the front door, okay? Now, directly in front of the front door. All right. Now, I'm going to take a straight walk from this front door, 
and let's see where we are lined up with. Now as I walk directly from the front door, it's directly in line with the front gate of the graveyard. All right? And not only that, everybody, but check this out. Let's hurry up before somebody uh, might want to bother us with this one. You know, want you to see this as well. I want you to take a look at this garage, because this is really creepy stuff. Notice the garage. Look at this. There's a wall here in front of the garage, but that's not it. Take a look at this garage. Everything is covered up. You can't see anything inside. Even this side. Black curtains over the window. And then look at this little slim door that you got here. Perfect to put little children through if you're trying to bring them inside and use them for whatever occult practices that you might be partaking in. This is truly textbook this is textbook according to their literature. Now I'm not going to tell you what you should believe, but I'm going to tell you that something's not right, and you need to take mind of it. Okay, go, please go ahead, go ahead. Well, yeah, that's because it's a, it's a, it's a job interest. It's, it's one of their jobs. And also, also pay for their it's absolutely and sick, by the way, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it is sick, but you know, you gotta look at it. Everything has a foundation. Whatever it is, has a, a foundation. You want to find out about an organization or a person, you go to the foundation, and you can see if you've got a if you've got a corrupt one, if That's something's right. built corruptly, it will, no matter what you do in the future, it'll always be corrupt. deals with devil worship and satanic beliefs. It contains explicit scenes and descriptions of violent crimes and rituals. Because of the program's theme and controversial subject matter, parental discretion should be exercised. You have to give a blood sacrifice to Satan. It's supposed to keep you protected. It's supposed to keep you pure. They said that if you told that the devil would come and kill our parents, it doesn't matter if you believe in Satan. It doesn't matter if you believe in demons. What's important is to know that there are people out there that do, and they're willing to do anything to accomplish their goal. Satanism is more than a hodgepodge of mysticism and fantasy, more than a Halloween motif. It's a violent impulse that preys on the emotionally vulnerable, especially teenagers, often lonely and lost. It basically started out like the, the killing of animals, and there's always the heavy metal music and drugs don't help it attracts the angry and the powerless who up and sink at the secret lie they uh, asked me if i had ever thought about killing somebody just to watch them die and they asked me if i would like to join a satanic cult possessed by an obsessive fascination with sex and drugs and yes heavy metal rock and roll Satan, often satanism seems to be a personal psychodrama a kind of license for strange sometimes violent behavior a bloodbath would be a cleansing and a purification of a planet that has been dirtied and degraded for too long. Sometimes it's just half-baked mumbo-jumbo and scrawled symbols. But other times it goes deeper, deadly. Tommy died uh, as brutally as his mother did, but at his own hands. I left him dearly, but he also took my wife who I left. Satanism goes far beyond teenage obsession. Today there are cults that worship the devil, engage in secret ceremonies, believe in ancient, though bizarre theology, all of it constitutionally protected, as long as no laws are broken. But I believe that hate is necessary in a controlled way just as much as love is necessary. The other face of adult Satanism is violent and fiendish, 
centered on sexual ritual and torture, frequently descending into the vilest crime of all, sexual abuse of children. He has drawn pictures of a uh, child being sacrificed. Uh, he's talked about animal sacrifices. He's disclosed molestation. And what of their own children? Some are born into satanic cults and grow up as lifelong members. Others are desperate to flee, but dread the penalty of grotesque death. They're going to catch me, it don't matter. I could run and run and run, they're always going to catch me because they're all over. And beyond the mayhem and monsters, it's said that a nationwide network of satanic criminals exists. Start with the warped and wicked Charles Manson. It's everything that human beings are, don't understand. It's all their fears. It's what they're not sure of. You dig what I'm saying? Satan to me would be God. Well, the demented son of Sam Killer, David Berkowitz. These and others, purportedly linked to the devil worship underground. Who is Satan? Who is Satan? Who is Satan? It's all over the United States and probably all over the world because it's just something that people are experimenting with now. Impossible to measure. Easy to doubt. The very mention of it invites ridicule. Come out. No. I won't let her go. No. Often the choice is to avoid confronting. Ignore it. Find other explanations. Or laugh it off. That is not the choice we have made tonight. We have chosen to ask why. Via satellite, we'll be asking the youngest person on Oklahoma's death row, just 17 when he killed in the name of Satan, why he murdered his own parents. And to Southern California, where we will ask the parents of children in the notorious McMartin Preschool why they claim their kids were satanically abused. And to London, where rock star Ozzy Osbourne will tell us why he feels he and heavy metal music are getting a bum rap. And to the state penitentiary in Angola, Louisiana, to ask convicted killer Charles Gervais why he thought the devil would award him 10,000 souls. The Investigative News Group presents the Geraldo Rivera Special. Devil Worship. Exposing Satan's Underground. Whether a Satan exists is a matter of belief. But we are certain that Satanism exists. To some it's a religion. To others it's the practice of evil in the devil's name. It exists and it's flourishing. Members of our studio audience tonight will attest to that. They are friends and foes of Satanism. Devil worshippers and law enforcers, experts and victims. They'll help us understand this force that exalts evil and darkness. We'll be asking why. Why does it exist? And why does it appeal to so many vulnerable people, especially the young? Now the very young and the impressionable should definitely not be watching this program tonight. This is not a Halloween fable. This is a real life horror story and it will give small children bad dreams. As for teenagers and their parents, we hope you are watching because it's teenagers who are most likely to fall under the spell of this jumble of dark, violent emotions called Satanism, and in some cases, to be driven into committing terrible deeds. Being into heavy metal doesn't necessarily mean your kid's also into Satanism. And most of these fans are not. But there is an undeniable connection between obsession with the really hard stuff and the occult. This stone pony from Kansas City is named Spike. The upside down cross is a symbol of Satan. Ozzy is the rock and roll team. And most acid rock is involved with Satanism. Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast. A heavy metal freak from Louisiana, Joe got himself into self-mutilation in Satan's name. We cut our arms and let the blood drip into a cup and we pass it around and drink from the cup from each other's blood. Kim from Colorado also practiced the gruesome ritual. Violence with blood, we like to see blood and 
We used to eat blood and stuff like that. Drinking blood as entertainment is apparently a staple in the acts of heavy metalists like Wasp. My life became centered not only around the marijuana I, I was smoking and the booze I was drinking, but it became centered around Satan. Although Satanism is more obvious in the lyrics of groups like Megadeth, Slayer, Venom, and Iron Maiden, in St. Petersburg, Florida recently, satanic symbols filled the air at this concert by Danish-born King Diamond. How much can you influence kids? I think people are too clever to be influenced by watching a band or listening to an album to go out and do the same, because if they were that easy to influence, watching the news, you get the real thing, and everybody knows that right into your living room. Personally, I am a Satanist, a practicing Satanist, but we never tried to preach that religion to anybody. Bull. An avowed Satanist, Diamond's protest that he's not preaching is belied by lyrics laced with references to death, graves, and evil. Of course, to some, it's just rock and roll rebellion. Satan has nothing to do with this kind of a concert. It's just an hour to have a good time. Parents think, oh, Satanism, their kids, it's killing their kids. It's not killing their kids. The parents are screwing up in the beginning. We're the next generation. Are you not Whatever the connection, there is no doubt that teenage satanic activity in this country is increasing dramatically. In Bayou Country in southwest Louisiana, one persistent problem has been grave robbing. So what do they take out of these? They, they take out uh, the bones, okay, uh, especially on the older uh, type grave sites as this, because our understanding is that uh, the right little finger has something to do with their culture, and uh, they make a... Uh, necklace out of them and they wear them. A necklace out of the, the right the knuckle? The right knuckle. And the graffiti is no longer John Loves Mary. Death chamber, the point of no return, this says. As you walk into the main vault, it's the devil's pentagram, 666, the sign of the devil. Over here, a bloody skull and crossbones. In Maine, a dozen churches were defaced with satanic symbols. In California, New Jersey, Alabama, and elsewhere, Police have found inverted crosses and the remains of mutilated animals. But by far the most frightening of all are the reports of teenagers killing other kids in Satan's name. Item Douglas County, Georgia. I'm sorry for you, young lady, and I sentence you to a, a term of life in prison. I'm sorry for you, and I wish you good luck. <coughs> Remove her from the courtroom, Mr. Sheriff. 17-year-old Melissa Ernest and two other teenage members of her coven admitted drinking her 15-year-old victim's blood, then dancing around her still warm body. Now listen to this report from a small town in Maine. Yesterday's conviction of Scott Waterhouse for the murder of 12-year-old Giselle Cody may finally bring an end to talk of a satanic cult in the town. Item Long Island, New York. Police arrest 17-year-old Ricky Casso for the ritual murder of 15-year-old Gary Lowers. Casso gouged out his victim's eyes. As we've seen, the level of violence in these crimes committed in Satan's name is often appalling and savage, brutal enough to shock even hardened police officers. Detective Paul Hart thought he had seen everything. Then this veteran New Jersey officer saw how a suburban teenager murdered and mutilated his own mother. I believe that evil will once again rise and conquer the love of God. If this pact is to your approval, sign below. Just barely 14 years old, Tommy Sullivan had written this contract with the devil before he butchered his mother with his Boy Scout knife. The murder took place in the basement of the Sullivan family home. As we came down here, we found uh, Mrs. Sullivan laying on the floor just about in this area here. Uh, describe the condition of the body. It appeared that her throat had been cut and a good portion of her face had literally been slashed away. Tommy died uh, as brutally as his mother did but at his own hands. What did Tommy then manage to do to himself? What wounds did he inflict on himself to kill himself? His first uh, self-inflicted wounds were a series of wounds to his wrists. Uh, three, if I, can re if I remember correctly, uh, deep enough to actually sever um, the arteries and, and, the, and the tendons in his arm, enough to snap back his wrist. And after doing that, he literally slit his throat from ear to ear with his three and a half inch knife from the windpipe all the way back to the spinal column. 
and to the point of almost taking his head off. Understandably unable to live with the gruesome memories in their family, Tommy's father and younger brother have moved out of state. Do you think you can ever find it in your heart to forgive your son? I don't know. I loved him dearly. But he also took my wife who I loved. How could this happen here? To a nice boy from a good Catholic school and a fine middle-class family. Sure, he was obsessed by the symbols. This is what his room looked like on the night of the murder and suicide. But heavy metal is not answer enough. You're a veteran of Vietnam. Had you ever seen anything that brutal? Certainly in, a, uh, in an area like this, in a town like this, in a neighborhood like this, you don't expect to see that type of, of violence. And uh, it was brutal. It was brutal. And um, uh, there's few of us that will forget that. Nor do you forget these drawings Tommy made just before he killed himself. But you continue to search for the reasons. What made Tommy? What made the others do it? As reporters investigating this story for months, we have a good idea of what's going on in this country. Our big question tonight is why. This is Detective Sergeant Paul Hart. Yes, stand up, Paul. He's the man, uh, the cop who investigated the Tommy Sullivan tragedy. I've never heard of wounds that ferocious, and the pictures are even more appalling, pictures that we did not show here. Do you think, you're not a theologian, a theologian, you're a cop, do you think that Tommy was possessed? Uh, I think that uh, possession is a state of mind, and it would have been a hell of an interview with Tommy had we located him. Um, certainly, like I had said before, the, his death was as, as violent as his mother's. Father Labar, you investigate these cases for the Catholic Church. Is it the Church's position that demonic possession is possible? It certainly is. There have been many cases down through the centuries, many in, in our own uh, decade, for example, of where the devil has actually possessed people and caused them to do many strange things. So you believe it's possible? It's, I believe not only is it possible, it is a reality in some very select amount of cases. Let's go to, uh, to London for a, a quick in, uh, exchange with Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy, I'm, I'm glad you're on the program. I'll interview you in greater detail in a couple of minutes. The one thing I have to ask you now, though, is, of course, the vast majority of your fans and the fans of heavy metal music are not Satanists. But there is no doubt, at least not in our reporting, that, say, uh, that heavy metal music plays a role. Every single kid that we, whose case we know about, who committed a violent act in Satan's name was also into heavy metal music. What's your response to that, Oz? Well, I don't really know. All I, all I do is... Um make music you know i don't i don't i don't sit down and purposely plan to freak everybody out i mean i always have played heavy metal music uh, i suppose when i was younger and i started writing songs my world was kind of dark and dingy and i was i came from a working class family who had nothing no no dough no prospect of ever having much money and so that's that's how i saw the world as a child and so I mean, I, not all my songs are about satanism of course in not. fact if you Stand by, Ozzy, because I, I want to get to Sean Sellers, who's the youngest kid ever to go on death row in Oklahoma. Uh, Sean is a kid who murdered his mother, murdered his stepfather, murdered a convenience store clerk. What did Satanism have to do with it, Sean? What did Satan, do you feel, have to do with first your murder of that convenience store clerk? Satanism was... Well, the murder was because it was a... Um... I would say this so that you can understand it. It was a sacrifice to prove allegiance to Satan, to prove um, my hatred towards society and everything. Um, well, hatred towards society is one thing, Sean, but how uh, does Satan make you commit murder? Uh, yeah, but, but Geraldo, Sean, in that particular situation, uh, Sean Sellers. This is Tom Wedge, an expert in Satanism, who is with yes. Sean in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Yeah, right. go ahead, quickly. Uh, Sean, Sean had broken every one of the Ten Commandments except thou shalt not commit murder. And after he worshipped before the altar, 
and uh, with uh, and asked for powers from Satan, uh, he went out to to do this. Uh, technically, it was a human sacrifice. Okay, I gotta move on. You guys stand by. We'll get back to you. Stay with us, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna get into the mind of another all-American boy who came under the influence of Satanism and took part in a crime without passion or motive. He and his pals beat another classmate to death. We'll be right back. As you may have heard, we faced a much publicized dilemma in putting this program together. Many of the things about Satanism are offensive, and putting on an offensive television show was not our aim, so the most gruesome scenes have been left out. Now, what we've kept is strong. We think it's strong enough to get across an effective warning. Satanism can be cause for concern. Its roots are anywhere. Its roots are even in the very heartland of this country. Take a look. Carl Junction, Missouri a town of about 4,000 souls in the heart of the Bible Belt, where people believe in God and the devil. Periodically, satanic graffiti and some mutilated animals turn up, causing alarmists to cry that satanic cults are operating in the area. Those charges were routinely discounted until a group of students from this high school shocked the entire nation. Late one night last December, four teenagers who had been dabbling in Satanism carried baseball bats, a cat, and a length of rope to an isolated spot near their small town here in Missouri. By the time the night was over, the cat had been mutilated and one of the boys beaten to death by the other three, who then dumped his body in a well. One of the kids who did it, Pete Rowland, is now serving life sentence without parole here at this maximum security facility in Fulton, Missouri. The other two boys, his classmates, were also sentenced to life. Have you ever been in here in the first school? interview since the murder, Pete Rowland talks about the satanic elements of the crime. What was it about Satanism that attracted you? Power. Just, you know, with power comes money, comes girls, just the feeling of people looking up to you, popularity. You're a good-looking guy, smart. Wouldn't you have those things anyway? It, it just seemed easier through the devil. The devil was the spur for this murder, which Pete confessed on this never-before-seen police videotape. Yes. Go ahead and show us what you did. Okay. And I got him right through here, and I grabbed the old hand, and I pulled him through to right here. We saw the victim, there, and he was, he was still moaning a little bit and going, uh, uh, like, kind of like that. Right this bat here, Pete. Okay, this is the bat that I threw. This is the third bat. Quite a bit of blood and hair on this thing. You can see a lot of hair on the end of it. Who all hit him? Me, myself, um, Jim Hardy, and Ron Clement. It basically started out like with the killing of animals. Then there's always the heavy metal music and drugs don't help. Sometimes I didn't feel like I was the master of my own body. Like something else kind of took over with inside of my mind. What took over? Just the violence, the devil lust and greed for drugs, for money. Pete gradually withdrew from family life. That is probably one of the main things I noticed. Um, he even got to where he avoided eating meals with us. He listened to the music, heavy metal music, every opportunity. Another example of the link between heavy metal and teenage satanic crime. Describe what this music did to you. It was kind of like in the way of the, when we killed animals, it was just like, it would just go, things would go through my mind and I could see the thoughts, I could see me hurting someone, you know, torturing people. And just along with the words too, some of it was just all hell Satan and ripping apart, severing flesh, gouging eyes, things like that, you know. And after you listen to this, you know, three or four hours a day, every day for, you know, years or months, and it can get to you. Why did you choose this guy as your victim? Why Steve? Just because he was a human. Just because we could deceive him easy. The boy deceived was 19-year-old Stephen Newberry, who then took the first of some 70 blows as his classmates swung their baseball bats. I, I kind of looked down and I heard a pop and I just I knew what it was. And I looked up and 
And Steve's eyes were real big, you know. And he just said, you know, why me? Why me? And he just looked like he was really sad. And, and one of them, someone said, because it's fun, Steve. And then we just all just, just like vultures, you know. I mean, we just went in. Just it happened, you know. You hit him. Yes. In the head. Yes. How many times? A lot. And I look at my hands sometimes, and I think, you know, are these the hands that killed him? And I mean, I know they are, but it just doesn't seem like it, you know. I, I don't want to, you know, I would never want to kill anybody again. I mean, I, right after we did what we did, I just, I felt real empty inside. I felt like I could never love again, you know? I felt like a zombie. The devil double-crossed you? Yes. It just leads to your own destruction. How do you know that now? Look where I'm at, you know? Look at my sentence. I mean, I'm in, I'm in jail with life without parole. I feel very guilty that I didn't pay attention, that, that I didn't... There were some things that I saw that I sh feel like I should have paid attention to. I saw the album covers, and they're hideous. I just assumed that if they sell it, it's got to be okay. Uh, I saw satanic symbols on his book work, and I had spoken to him about it. Didn't mean anything, you know. It was. I assumed it was a passing phase. I had my things when I was that age. I assumed that he had his. I assumed wrong, and I would advise anybody if they see anything like that, to look into it. Don't ignore it. It doesn't pass. It's just something I'll never get over, ever. Parents, heed the advice of Pete Rowland's mom. Pay attention. Satanism is not a harmless fad or a passing phase in some of these kids' lives. Ozzy, yeah? I know that your lyrics are less excessive than groups like uh, Slayer or Venom or uh, Iron Maiden or some of the others but still for some reason maybe it's because you've been a around for so long I see tattoos of your name on some of these uh, you know teenage devil worshippers arms wherever I see devil graffiti and satanic graffiti I see your name also do you feel a sense of responsibility Oz? The only responsibility I feel is, is the fact that I, I just, I'm, a, I'm a true musician in of, of what I play. I don't, I don't want to make anybody start doing all this devil worship crap because that's not my intention. Although I have sang on a few songs about the devil, you know, that's about it. You know, I, I don't want anyone to harm themselves. What that's about the intention. issue of responsibility? What about the whole thing about guilt? Do you feel responsible? I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel guilty. I feel um, kind of persecuted by everybody because I'm not a bad guy. I'm, I'm, it, n my intentions are not to harm anyone. In fact, it's, dead, it's directly the opposite. Like when people come to my concerts, I want them to have a good, fun evening out, you know. And it's, it's, it seems to me that a lot of people judge the book by the cover more. more. So they, they write things about me where they don't even know that I talk, what they're talking about, you know. Well, there are lots of people out there, lots of people here in our studio audience who have a very different point of view. We'll get to them coming up next, a look into the dark soul of Satanism. Stay with us. Satan means whatever I'm looking at, whatever I want it to mean. It's on my forehead. It's, it, it's, me on, it's me if I can get up on that highway. It's me, it's me trying to save my air, my water, my trees, my wildlife. It's me on that cameraman. The Geraldo Rivera special, Devil Worship, will continue. Once again, a warning about some tough language and descriptions in a report that we'll have for you in just a moment. Let me introduce you first, though, to Zena LaVey. Her father, Anton LaVey, is, uh, I guess, the founding father of Satanism in this country. Uh, he founding it what, about 25 years ago, Zena? Yeah, approximately 25 years. Can you tell us with any certainty how widespread the religion 
of Satanism is in this country or around the world? Well, the religion is worldwide. Um, we have members just throughout the world, and it's a legitimate religion. Um, it's, um, you know, perfectly within uh, the... <laughs> it's legal. <laughs> but how many people? Hundreds, oh, thousands, tens thousands. of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Hundreds of thousands, I can't say. Thousands, easily. What is it, Dr. What? Aquino? Dr. Aquino, the high priest of the Church of Set? Temple of Set. Temple of Set, also a colonel, interestingly enough, in the United States Army. What is it, this Satanism? I think that um, uh, there is some confusion tonight because this same term means something different to Satanists than it does to Christians in the United States. By our own standards, the people who you've shown in these film clips would not be Satanists, either present or in the past. Rather, they would be the failures of a conventional religion. I appreciate your opinion. What is it, sir, then? What is Satanism? Well, originally the Church of Satan, when it was founded, was composed not of people with a hatred for Christianity, but of people who, by and large, were agnostics and atheists, because they felt that the institutions which had arisen around Christianity had failed in their moral commitment. So Satanism itself became an emphasis on rational self-interest and on taking responsibility for your own intellectual and ethical decisions. Rational self-interest, you call it? Yes. Okay, one thing we do know that Satanism has in common with other religions is the belief that the devil can inhabit your body. Remember the movie Exorcist, the film? It dealt with ridding the body of Satan in a ritual called exorcism. As we discovered in the heart of the Haitian section of Brooklyn, New York, Exorcism is more than just a scene in a movie. It's a common aspect of some people's religious beliefs. Operating out of the back room of this religious curio shop, a voodoo priest regularly performs exorcism. This one on a woman whose persistent stomach pains were thought to be caused by the devil inside her. I know you've been possessed by the devil for so many years. He's been bad at you. With the help of several assistants and accompanied by throbbing traditional music, the priest's incantations built to a crescendo. Then, in a moment of almost sexual release, the devil was purged from the patient. The chicken in death, the chicken take all the malady, all the sickness away from you. Yes. In every way. Southern California is a very long way from the heart of Brooklyn. But at the church of a preacher named Roy Masters, exorcisms of the devil appear just as sincere, far out, and dramatic. With a background in show business rather than theology, Masters claims the members of his congregation react so profoundly to the laying on of the cross because they feel and fear themselves possessed by the devil. Come out. No. I won't let her go. No. Devil worship is as old as religion itself. It's the grim alternative, the flip side of life. Evil over good, dark over light, Satan over God himself. Come forth and bestow these blessings of hell upon us. Forced underground by the religious hysteria of the Middle Ages, Satanism was resurrected, first by an Englishman named Aleister Crowley in the early 20th century. It entered its modern era in this country just about 25 years ago, under the theatrical guidance of Anton LaVey, California-based high priest of present-day devil worship. LaVey founded the Church of Satan, now, despite its preachings of evil and hate, the church and its offshoots are constitutionally protected religions. I believe that hate is necessary in a controlled way just as much as love is necessary. LaVey penned the best-selling Satanic Bible. It's the handbook of devil worshippers everywhere. And for a time, he was considered chic enough to attract the attention of Hollywood. After working together on a film, LaVey made Sammy Davis Jr. an honorary member. While the late Jane Mansfield, was for a time among LaVey's most passionate followers. Most of the people that are in my group are professional people, they're business people, they're people that are from very responsible walks of life.
Contemporary Satanism relies heavily on bizarre and sometimes bloody ceremonies. One of the ugliest, yet apparently most common rituals in devil worship is the sacrifice of animals, often involving the removal of organs and the draining of their blood in elaborate ceremonies. Well, a series of cattle mutilations on this Louisiana farm has sent the shiver of fear through this entire community. Show me the evidence that this was some kind of ritual. Oh, this hole right here and the tail, they cut the tail off. The same thing with the ears. They cut the ears off. Right. So you two have no doubt but that your animals were used in some kind of ritual. Right. Yes. All yeah. the blood was gone out of them, too. Every one of them, the blood was drained. No blood, no insides, eyes pulled out, everything. I'm begging for something to be done. I'm scared. In response to the animal mutilations and other mysterious and unsolved crimes in this area, the local fundamentalist church held an extraordinary service. There's been a lot of questions about are there any witchcraft, occultism, Satan worshippers in the area? And the answer is obviously yes. The only way to deal with Satan, which is spirit, is by way of spirit. The preacher asked his flock to protect themselves with their faith. But some chose a more down-to-earth method. Brother Blunt, I believe in the Lord, and I believe in you. But I'm still going to carry my gun because I'm scared. In our investigation, we discovered that some of Satan's soldiers are also high-ranking officers in the United States military. Here at San Francisco's Presidio Army Base, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino led a double life as a satanic high priest. The colonel's cult is listed in the San Francisco telephone book and his phone answering machine boasts of his affiliation. This is the Temple of Set. The temple is the only international satanic religious institution fully recognized by the United States government. Indeed, the army does officially recognize Satanism as a legitimate religion and supplies chaplains with this guide for ministering to the satanic soldier. Yet unofficially, some charge that army bases have become sanctuaries for devil worshippers. Just last month, under a full moon, I took a midnight tour of the Presidio grounds with police investigator Ed Abanovsky. Are you saying that there was a satanic cult active right here on the army base? Yes, we believe so. There's evidence to substantiate that. They had uh, satanic rituals going on. There's an altar in there, and all of the graffiti on the wall would indicate that. Let's see if I can see it. How'd you find this place? This is a... Uh fortification during World War II, during World War II, where they had uh, gun batteries. I can see a pentagram painted on the wall. I can see the words Prince of Darkness. On this wall, I see several inverted crosses and other obvious uh, satanic ritualistic paintings or symbols. Joseph, we've agreed to conceal your identity, but you are an officer in the United States Army. That's correct. And you were an officer in the United States Army during the time you were a member of this satanic organization. Yes. Did the authorities at the Presidio know that a satanic organization was active on their base during the time that you were a member? They were very much aware of it, yes. The present base commander, Colonel Rafferty, says that today at least... I know of no satanic activities whatsoever in this area. Satanism may be a constitutionally protected religion. But similar to another recent case at the United States Military Academy at West Point, here charges surface connecting ritual child abuse at the Presidio Daycare Center to the devil cult. It was here, parents and others allege, that as many as 60 young children were ritualistically abused by soldiers of Satan. What actually was done to the kids? Uh, oral copulation, sodomy, uh, defecation, uh, they were urinated on. The former chief juvenile investigator at the Presidio, Ed Abinovsky, is here. He's now a deputy sheriff in Sarah, Santa Clara County. Colonel Laquino, we note, sir, for the record, that you were originally implicated in the dreadful charges of child abuse. We note also that no charges were ever brought against you, and presumably you have been cleared. Would you like to comment on why those charges were brought against you? Well, the entire time that uh, the so-called child molestation scandal was occurring at the Presidio, the time period when um, uh, these terrible events were supposedly taking place, 
I was assigned to the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., and my wife was out there living with me. But is it not a fact that a three-and-a-half-year-old girl identified you as the alleged perpetrator of molestation? No. As uh, a matter of fact, it is not the case. An accusation was made by her stepfather, who was an Army chaplain, speaking on behalf of this child. In her original interview with the FBI, she denied ever being molested. Well, I've seen the... I, I, you are innocent until proven guilty. You were never charged in this case. I don't want to belabor the point. I have seen, however, the affidavits for the search warrant of your home, and they indicate the child is speaking to the authorities, not her father. This was after she had been subjected to uh, therapy. Let's say you are innocent of that. You are no longer at the Presidio. You are now in St. Louis, but you are still a serving officer, a colonel in the United States Army. Do you feel it is inconsistent with a high-ranking officer pledged, sworn, to uphold the Constitution of the United States that you are also a practicing Satanist? Not in the least. The Army has known of my religion for the last 20 years. There has never been a problem with it, any more than there is a problem with other members of minority religions. But let me read from the Satanic Bible. Quote, one of, this is the, no, the number one, uh, uh, I guess, uh, commandment. Death to the weakling, wealth to the strong. How can you believe this and still uphold the Constitution of the United States? Death to the weakling? Well, for one thing, what you're looking at there is a highly polemical book that was never meant to be taken literally in Written all of its commandments. Father. Yes, and I'm aware of that, and I'm also saying that members of the Church of Satan understood that much of this book was in the form of a polemic. It was a statement uh, that was dramatically made, but was not intended to be taken literally in all its respects. So we should not take this book literally? Correct. This is Dr. Walter Grote, would you stand, sir? Whose daughter was allegedly abused at West Point, the United States Military Academy. You were a captain in the United States Army. Aside from what allegedly happened to your daughter, which you, I know you allege was part of a satanic cult, and having nothing to do with this man, I state again, for the record. What is your feeling, sir, on the fact that a serving officer in the United States Army is also a professed Satanist, a high-ranking person? Well, I think uh, in this election year, we've heard a lot about values, Geraldo. Um, we've heard a lot that our little children, our little children should be saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Uh, Mr. Aquino has identified himself as an antichrist. He preaches that as the leader of the temple said. I don't think I'm misquoting him. I find it inconceivable that we can have candidates talking about one nation under God and having our children say that, yet by the same token we can have somebody in our army as a colonel leading our troops in battle who are opposed to the very concept of God and whose whole purpose it is is to fight against God. We have to take a break right here. Next, more on the connection between Satanism and violence, including more charges of the sexual abuse of children. If you have let your kids watch up until now, we urge you, ladies and gentlemen, we are not kidding. Get them away from the TV during our next report. We'll be right back. Once again, parents, we urge you to heed our strongest warning about this next report on the abuse of children, the alleged abuse of children, because if the point of devil worship is evil, what could be more evil than this? That's the baby right there. Right here? Uh-huh. It came out of her already. What'd then, they do to the baby? Then David took it and kept throwing it against the wall, and, it, and he killed it, and he took it in the house. No, you saw that? Yeah. These are pictures that can chill a parent's soul. They're a symptom that something dreadful, unspeakable has happened to the child. In this case, it's an eight-year-old boy from Grenada, Mississippi. They took it in an old caboose. And they had these things they called spangs. Spangs? Yes, yeah, spangs. They stuck it up my butt. Who but stuck it? David. Your dad? Uh-huh. Ow, did it hurt. Two doctors have provided medical evidence that from a very early age, this boy has been repeatedly abused. His mother goes further. She claims the sexual abuse happened as part of a satanic ritual. Do you allege your husband was part of a satanic cult? I allege that he was the high priest of a satanic cult. David, the boy's father, has never been formally charged. He's now in hiding. Now, incest is certainly not new, but apparently more and more of it is taking on the dark overtones of Satan. 
She talked about there being a Satan, and she said she talked about there being boys that had hurt her. Listen to what this five-year-old girl from Orange County, California, told her mother her father did to her. Daddy um, was heading the meeting, and he wore a real life's baby foot around his neck. She says they each drank the blood, and then they all hurt me. Said, how did they hurt you? She spread her legs and pointed to their crotch and says, right here. And it gets worse. According to his family, this severely traumatized 10-year-old boy, also from Southern California, was allegedly molested by a trusted neighborhood minister as part of an ongoing satanic cult. Jimmy talks about having a gun held to his head, about being shown a skeleton, about having to touch the skeleton. He has drawn pictures of a child being sacrificed. Uh, he's talked about animal sacrifices. He's disclosed molestation. In the very places created to care for children, in nurseries and daycare centers across the nation, there are increasing reports of ritual sexual abuse. The children of McMartin are still filled with lurid stories of their awful experience there. What did they say the devil would do to you? They said that if we told that the devil would come and kill our parents, and he said that we wouldn't live to be the age nine. What were they doing to you? Molesting me. What does um, that mean? What does molesting you mean? Touching us in places we don't want, and then they would, like, threaten us, like, oh, you don't say a word else. We're going to come to your house and kill everybody except for you, and we're going to send you to the devil and everything. And they would scare us really much. No region in this country is beyond the reach of the devil worshippers. Even here in the heartland of America, stories of ritual abuse crop up. The children you're about to meet were born into it. They say their parents forced them to witness bloody rituals, and even they say to participate in ritual murder. Now in the safe haven of a concerned foster family, the children are haunted by their personal nightmares. My dad was involved in a lot of it, okay? He's like one of the main guys. He's a leader or something. He made us have sex with him and with other guys, and he's done it with other people. Um, I don't know. I just don't like him. Tell us what else besides having sex with him and the other guys that made you do. Kill kids and be there and involved in everything else that happened. And I had to be there. And if I didn't, he threatened you know, like you're going to be killed or people aren't going to believe you if you tell anybody. Um, or I'll find you, you know. So he said there's no way out and you must do it. We found out she had been defecated on that it was smeared all over her body and put in her mouth. My children have talked about all of those things and worse. They've talked about having to kill other children. Well, she told me about the time um, from as, as we think was about a year and a half, year and a half, two years old, when um, this was the satanic cult that she was involved with. And um, she was made to take a gun and put it up to someone's head it was another child and pull the trigger one of the greatest difficulties in reporting a story like this one is that so much of it sounds so outrageous too dreadful too bizarre to be true well here in nebraska and elsewhere across this nation concerned citizens have gotten together to defeat that disbelief this organization is called believe the children its guiding principle that the stories these young victims are telling are too widespread too consistent not to be true the stories are so outrageous, and I am such an honest person, I assumed everybody would believe me. And to this day, I'll get in the middle of a story and I'll think, they're going to think I'm crazy. This sounds crazy. But when you begin to hear this same thing time and again, different stories, but the same, the same horrible underlying things, the same behaviors in the kids, I just want to scream. I'm a stranger. I come up to you and you tell me this story and I say, I don't believe you. How do you react? What do you do? I just say, well, that's your right not to believe it. But someday, if you see something or you hear something from somebody else, just remember what you heard from me. If we were lying, I don't think we would come up with such good lies. Are you telling us the truth? If this isn't true, I mean, you can do anything you want with me, but it's true. So sad. 
Let's go now to the McMartin preschool parents who have gathered for us in Los Angeles. You recall that case, notorious case. I must state for the record, however, that the charges against most of the defendants have been dropped. Charges are still pending against two of them, however. We know that the parents and the children allege child abuse. What is much less known is that they say it was ritual abuse as part of a satanic cult. Whoever is the designated spokesman there, please tell us why you believe this was part of a ritual cult, uh, abuse as part of a satanic cult. Well, the easiest reason to that question, Geraldo, is the fact when the children started talking, they started talking about robes and candles. They described an Episcopal church. And once they started narrowing that down, you could see that it had to be satanic. It's very important in satanic religions to have a priest because they truly do believe in power. The difference only between Catholicism and the Episcopal religion uh, is almost done. They both use wine, they both use bread, and so on. The truth about Satanism is they truly do use blood, and they mix it with urine, and then they also use the real meat, the real flesh. This is what makes Satanism true, and this is what 1,200 molested kids in the city of Manhattan Beach have told the Sheriff's Department, and it's an outrage that we are where we are with this case, and these poor, unprotected kids that have, uh, that's a third of the school system in the city of Manhattan Beach has been molested. We have eight preschools closed here. This is the child molestation capital of the world. We have more preschools closed in this city than any city this side of Detroit, and I'm not picking on Detroit. Right. You may have heard of uh, a case here in New York recently, where last year actually a, a little six-year-old girl called Lisa Steinberg was murdered allegedly by her own step parents. Well, that trial for the murder of that little girl opened here in New York today. There were some shocking developments. The defense attorney stated that in some way the parents, or at least one of them, was a member of a satanic cult. That just today here in New York. We're joined now by Maury Terry, author of The Ultimate Evil. He has been studying this and other satanic cases. Why do you believe the satanic cult had something to do with this case of Lisa Steinberg? Well, in the first case, uh, instance, Raldo, uh, the police removed demonology books from the Steinberg and Nussbaum apartment in New York. In the second place, I have seen writings done by Hedda Nussbaum, the adopted mother of Lisa, if you will, in which she admitted that she was involved with a cult on Long Island that practiced rituals and conducted uh, pornography, uh, pornography and were involved in, in child pornography. What this the... here is uh, Hedda's diary. This is her own diary? Hedda's uh, appointment book diary from 1983. You can expect and... to be subpoenaed after this, sir. Yes. And in it, you can see here that Hedda was calling deprogrammers, cult deprogrammers, back in the fall of 1983 in order to try to get herself out of this group in Long Island that she had gotten involved with. You have a sketch drawn by Lisa? Uh, we found in the Steinberg apartment a sketch drawn by Lisa in her own hand. Her Look own at it, ladies book. That's drawn by Lisa Steinberg with the satanic pentagram on it and with the descending crescent moon above it. Uh, this, I was told, confirmed by a principal involved in the case that this was the costume that Lisa wore at the rituals on Long Island and that the costume scared her. I was also told by a principal involved in the case that they put makeup on Lisa in order to make her look more like an adult and she hated wearing the makeup. The prosecution is trying to present this case as a simple homicide. What I'm saying to you here now is that there is a lot more evidence in this case. The case goes much deeper than is being portrayed as going, and this evidence that we're revealing here tonight should certainly graphically uh, illustrate that fact. We'll be right back, folks. Berkowitz, Lucas, Ramirez, and Manson are the all-stars in the halls of infamy. But the vast majority of these ritual murders are not the work of the celebrated psychopaths. There are literally hundreds of cases most of us have never heard of. The Geraldo Rivera special, Devil Worship, will continue. Reminder, this program deals with devil worship and satanic beliefs. It contains explicit scenes and descriptions of violent crimes and rituals. Because of the program's theme and controversial subject matter, parental discretion should be exercised. The Geraldo Rivera Special. Devil Worship. Exposing Satan's Underground continues. Welcome back. 
The subject is Satanism, and I've been asked repeatedly where the idea to do it came from. Well, it goes back to someone that I interviewed for our special last spring on murder and the frightening fascination verging on adoration that so many people felt for this person. A murderer who would have us believe that he is the incarnation of the devil. Here's Charles Manson. Okay, I, mill, I, I kill everybody since day one. I murdered them all. I'm God and I've killed everybody. Or oh, the devil. Or oh, the devil, yeah, you could use the word devil or demons or whatever you want to call it. Mostly the devil in your world, is Well, okay, I'll play, I'll play. There's no, there's no game I can't play. There's you no game you, I haven't played. You are the devil. Yeah. Okay, I'll be the devil then. Along with Hitler, cult leader Charles Manson is today's top satanic celebrity. Yeah, I, uh, I, I chopped up nine hogs and I'm going to chop up some more, you <laughs> I'm going to kill you as many as I can. I'm going to pile you up to the sky. Responsible for at least nine ritual murders, Manson is revered by many modern-day devil worshippers who have adopted his philosophy of the mass extermination of those they consider unfit to live. We would like to see most of the human race killed off because it is unworthy. It is unworthy of the gift of life. Nicholas Schreck visited Charlie at San Quentin, keeps a picture of his hero on his apartment wall, and displays a lock of Manson's hair as if it were a sacred relic. A bloodbath would be a cleansing and a purification of a planet that has been dirtied and degraded for too long. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, was also a Satanist, the serial killer who terrorized New York while murdering five young women and seriously wounding at least six others. Berkowitz was deeply involved in bizarre rituals. So was Henry Lee Lucas, who told police he murdered his girlfriend, his mother, and others across the country all for a satanic cult. Why do they want to kill people? They're supposed to be for the reincarnation of the devil. And when a series of ritualistic rapes and murders hit Southern California, it should have come as no surprise that Richard Ramirez, the alleged night stalker, worshipped the devil. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail a belief system that exalts sadistic murder, torture, ritualistic suicide, and racial purity. This has historically been a sacred day, a day of purification, a day of hell and fury. We mourn not its victims, we honor its victors. In closing, I would remind those here that murder is the predator's prerogative, and there is no birth without blood. Berkowitz, Lucas, Ramirez, and Manson are the all-stars in the halls of infamy. But the vast majority of these ritual murders are not the work of the celebrated psychopaths. There are literally hundreds of cases most of us have never heard of. Like this satanic murder in Denver, Colorado, where the victim was handcuffed, chained, and slaughtered. Authorities claim that before he died, the victim participated in drinking his own blood. Or this diabolical example in the city by the bay. Here in a rundown San Francisco neighborhood far from the tourist attractions and the Golden Gate Bridge, a satanic cult committed crimes of incredible brutality. This is the story of that cult and of its leader, a devil-worshipping murderer named Clifford St. Joseph. The body was tucked underneath the front wheels on the curbside, wrapped in yellow blankets and tied with uh, guitar string. What was the condition of the body when you found it? It uh, had a number of unusual wounds on it. Uh, one of the most unusual things was a design carved into the chest of the individual. And once we examined it more closely, it was an upside down pentagram. The Devil's Pentagram, the inverted five-pointed star found on the unidentified corpse of St. Joseph's victim, is apparently the principal signature of Satanists. Like a recurring nightmare, it shows up at crime scenes and in their graffiti everywhere. At St. Joseph's apartment, where this grisly murder was committed, I talked to Ed, a fringe member of the cult, and the state star witness. What was going on in this apartment? They uh, asked me if I had ever thought about killing somebody just to watch him die, and they asked me if I would like to join a satanic cult. Ritual crime was apparently a regular occurrence at this apartment. In this case of torture and murder, the victim has never been identified. For purposes of this case, he was called John Doe Number 60. The first cut would be to the lips that sealed the person's 
mouth for all eternity. They also poured wax, I guess, in the eyes, and that sealed their eyes for all eternity. They did much more to John Doe number 60, but we'll spare you the details. Caught and convicted of murder, kidnapping, and ritual abuse, St. Joseph and another cult member are currently serving long prison sentences. Ed remains free although he claims only to have been a reluctant participant in the murder of John Doe 60. He does admit bringing a teenager here to be chained up and ritualistically abused. How can you say you have no guilt when you bring a 17-year-old kid in here, you help shackle him to a radiator, and then participate in his torture and sexual abuse? Well, I never participated in torture, and no torture was allowed of him. You were having sex with a kid who's chained up. What are you talking about? Well, Ricky, first of all, likes that type of sex. What was going on here is a, a nightmare. Yes, it is. Yes, it is a nightmare. Are there devil worshippers, are there murderers involved in this particular case still at large? In this particular case, yes. We do know of, of we have one person identified, one man, other man identified, who was present during this particular homicide. Do you think that this ritualistic stuff is spreading? It's all over the United States and probably all over the world because it's just something that people are experimenting with now. Oh. Satan means whatever I'm looking at, whatever I want it to mean. It's on my forehead. It's with me. On, it's me if I can get up on that highway. It's everything that human beings are, don't understand. It's all their fears. It's what they're not sure of. You dig what I'm saying? Satan to me would be God. That man is so repugnant. All of these satanic murderers are. The acts that they have been convicted of committing are so horrible that the question could fairly be raised again why are we doing this broadcast we are doing it ladies and gentlemen because it's our feeling that these cases are too often overlooked too often underreported we think that there is a widespread problem here that you deserve that you need to know about joining us right now via satellite we have another convicted satanic murderer his name is charles gervais he is currently serving a life sentence in Angola Penitentiary in Louisiana. Mr. Gervais, why, in Satan's name, did you hammer and strangle to death an innocent person? Did you really think, sir, that they were going to give you 10,000 souls, this devil? Um, well, Raldo, I can't talk about my case. Get to the point about Satanism, Charlie. Okay. It's, there's a lot of confusion in it, and it's mostly people that really don't understand. Listen, what about this 10,000 souls, Buster? That's what I want to know about. Well, that's what I've got into Satanism for. Why? Why? Because it possessed power. Where were you going to get this power? Where were you going to use this power? In hell. In hell. You want to kill a person on earth to get the power of 10,000 souls in hell? Are you sick? No. Nope. Why aren't you condemned to die? Why aren't I? Yeah. Did you hmm. use Satanism as a defense? Yes. Ted Gunderson. FBI veteran. Former head of the regional office in Los Angeles. Is there a network of these satanic murderers in this country, do you allege? I cannot say that there's a network of satanic murderers. I can say that based on information furnished to me by confidential sources and informants, based on interviews with dozens of uh, uh, survivors from the satanic uh, operations uh, through the years, satanic beliefs, etc., I can say that there is a network of these people across the country who are very active. Uh, they have their own rest and relaxation farm. Uh, they are in contact with each other. It ties in loosely to the drug operation. It uh, ties into motorcycle gangs. And it goes on and on. They have their own uh, people who are specialized in surveillances and photography uh, and in assassinations. After this commercial break, we're going to have the anatomy of a satanic crime, showing you why law enforcement has had such a difficult time coming to grips with the strange, shadowy world of satanic crime. Stay with us.
One reason we think you haven't heard more about them is that many satanic crimes are simply not recognized as such. Take a look at this report, please. These ritualistic crimes are everywhere, and yet in most communities they are either overlooked or underreported. There's an example going on right now here in Kansas City that tells us why. In this house, in a quiet residential neighborhood, a series of brutally violent, horrible crimes have been committed. And yet the police and prosecutor in this town seem either unable or unwilling to draw the obvious connection between what happened here and Satanism. All I know is uh, the whole thing was evil. This 22-year-old, call him Jay, escaped from the House of Horrors wearing only a dog collar. For four days, he had been ritualistically tortured by a man named Bob Berdella. He uh, took the, the transformer and hooked it to my genitals and stepped back and took pictures while I'm flopping around. What a sick dog. It seemed to never end, you know. After Jay escaped through a window by burning the ropes that bound him to the bed, the police arrested Berdella. When they searched his home, they found over 250 photographs of young men, including Jay in the process of being tortured, in some cases fatally. Hidden in the walls of the home, they also found a human skull. He had pictures of guys that he had did, did things to. Kids tied up and with marks on them and things. Apparently, Burdella would pick up young men, usually hustlers like Joe. Many of them runaways who cluster in Kansas City Strip. I need $25 for you. For a small amount of money, these kids go anywhere to do anything with anyone. Unfortunately, some went home with Verdella, whose involvement with devil worship was easily apparent. There was, for example, a satanic symbol on the outside wall of his house. His business card seemed straight from hell, and he ran this macabre shop of horrors, possibly stocking it with his own unique hobby. By agreement with the district attorney, Verdella was allowed to plead to one count of murder. He received a life sentence, but many people in this community are outraged that the investigation went no further. Did you pursue, did the police pursue, these allegations of satanic involvement? The police department, uh, it's my understanding, called in some people who knew about witchcraft to talk to them about that. That particular aspect of the case basically went nowhere. County legislator Carol Cole disagrees. Why do you think there is no attention being paid to that ritual aspect of this case? You're in the heart of America, the Bible Belt, and we hate to think that people like that live next door to us. We're turning our backs on acting like it doesn't happen. We're putting our hands over our eyes as if it didn't occur here, that it was just a murder. This is Detective Lee Orr of the neighboring Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Do you believe there is a satanic aspect to these horrible crimes? Yes, I'm sure there is, yes. Uh, we've also had contact with people that have come out of the occult, Satan worship, who have definitely made statements and uh, who I've interviewed uh, that state that uh, Mr. Rodella was involved uh, at a higher level than most in the occult. If these allegations exist, as we merit to you that they do, isn't it reasonable that if you pursued them with vigor, you might find evidence that could pin more of these crimes on this man that might help solve some of the cases of missing children and missing young adults that you have in this and surrounding communities? There isn't any question that if there are people who have information about him being involved in witchcraft or Satanism, and that information has not been given to us, that we would love to have it because it would be further leads that we could follow. Here perhaps are some leads for investigators to follow. Item. Police reports obtained by us show local authorities have long been aware that devil worshippers were conducting large-scale ceremonies in the Kansas City area. Ida. This young man says he was an eyewitness to a sexual orgy at Verdella's house, one with heavy satanic overtones. And Ida. This woman claims she met Verdella through her former husband, a high priest in a local satanic cult. We were at a meeting in the area, and he was up on the platform in a throne which symbolizes that that sacrifice at that particular meeting was for him was done for him so he was in an exalted position he was a vip yes he was what happened there at that ceremony there was a young man killed a young boy he was 16 years old 
Did you ever tell the police about any of this? No, I didn't. Why? People don't believe you when you talk about these things. People just do not believe these things happen. Remember, aside from the torture and sodomy of Jay who escaped, Burdella has pled guilty to just one murder, a runaway whose skull was found inside his house. A second murder charge is pending. Yet police sources tell us Burdella is suspected in at least seven homicides. When they excavated his backyard, they found remains of three people. Paul Howell believes his missing 19-year-old son was among them. They found a head right up here, I believe. A skull? A skull right up in this area somewhere. It is one thing for law enforcement to be uninformed. It's quite another, though, for them to refuse to follow known leads. Paul Howell alleges they did exactly that with the information he provided from his own investigation. For three years, he says, he begged them to investigate Burdella's suspected connection with his boy's disappearance. I dug through his trash and found different things. At one time, I thought it was dog remains. Later on, after the investigation, the police come in. Three years later, I found out that this is the way they said Bob disposed of some of the waste of the human remains. He put them in dog food bags and set them out in the trash. What must it be like to a father to think that his own son was disposed of in pieces in someone's garbage? It just uh, very upsetting, naturally, and want to get even. You want to find everybody that's involved beside Bob and hope that it don't happen to anybody else's kids. It apparently also happened to Harriet's kid, Bonnie's husband, James, who disappeared in 1985. When James first disappeared, even, we, we begged him to do something to go in Berdella's house to get a search warrant for any reason to try to find my son in there because it had been told to us that he was possibly chained up in the house in there. Photographs of James' tortured, apparently murdered body were among those seized by police. Will you charge Berdella with the murder of James Ferris? That is not something that I can tell you yes or no. Will you charge Berdella with the murder of Jerry Howell? And again, I can't tell you whether or not there will be charges brought against Mr. Berdella or anybody else for the murder of Mr. Howell. Is it possible that by narrowing the focus of the investigation, people who are involved in these awful acts are still free? Yes, there's no question about it. You cannot subdue individuals and photograph them and you're in the photos by yourself. So there is a great implication that somebody else that participated in this is still at loose and they're at large in the city and you're going to be reading about it again in another 12 or 16 months. I hope she's not right, but stand up. This is Detective Sergeant Lee Orr from the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. You saw him in the video piece. This is retired Detective Michael McKee of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Gentlemen, the Kansas City Star is reporting as late as yesterday that the district attorney in your community is still insisting that the Burdella case of serial murders or alleged serial murders is not related to Satanism, is not a ritual crime. You were one of the first cops on the scene. Do you believe that this case is satanic, satanically related? It's my opinion that it is. We recovered a ceremonial robe from the bedroom when we excavated the backyard and dug up the skull in the backyard. It was buried with a jar of feathers and had some burnt wood with it. We also recovered numerous books on the occult from the residence of Mr. Burdell. Now, whether these cases are not being treated as ritual crimes because of embarrassment to the community or because it's easier for cops just to prosecute them as, as simple homicides, we don't know. Coming up next, we have talked in this program so far, and you have heard the words about child abuse. A woman by the name of Cheryl Horton and others tell an even more grotesque story, ladies and gentlemen. Having babies to be turned over for human sacrifice to Satan. And we'll deal with that when we come back. I think sometimes that, uh, ironically, on television, when you give a disclaimer, it has exact, exactly the opposite to the intended effect, and more people tune in than tune out. I'm going to say this as straight as I possibly can. I am begging you, if you're a parent and you've got kids there, that this subject is just too upsetting 
for your young children. Please get them out of the room or change the station. We urge you to exercise parental discretion. It has been established, as you have already seen on this program, in courts of law now, that human sacrifice is sometimes an element in rituals performed by people calling themselves Satanists. There is no longer any doubt about that, though just how often it actually is done is obviously impossible to know. The ideal sacrifice, we are told, apparently requires babies. And there are those. People in satanic sex, including mothers who have belonged, who tell of babies being bred for sacrifice. Take a look. Read what they do, Guy. They use blood in their rituals, and the blood that has the most power is baby's blood. In the classic horror film, Rosemary's Baby, Mia Farrow is drawn into the clutches of a satanic cult and is married to the devil. This is no dream. This is really happening. She conceives the Antichrist, providing the group with a living symbol of Satan to be worshipped and adored. God is dead! As sickening and unbelievable as it sounds, bearing children for use in satanic rituals may really be happening. My daughter, who I named Wendy, was sacrificed at birth with an upside-down cross and then taken outside and buried. Um, my son, they kept and let live till two years old, and then he was sacrificed. Michael and I had a son, and he was dedicated to Satan at birth. And at six months of age, he was sacrificed to Satan. It is most common for the heart to be taken from the child and offered to Satan. These women say they speak from personal experience. They claim to be breeders, forced by covens to bear children, both as a way for the cults to get new members and to find fresh victims for ritual murder. Did you give birth to infants who were sacrificed? To My first two. Or sacrifice. Or sacrifice. I was told it was the highest honor I could ever do as a woman, was to sacrifice my first two. And you did that? I was so brainwashed, I believed the, their philosophy. Jackie tells us she was able to escape her satanic cult. Today she helps other women, like Donna, who are trying to break free. You killed your babies? Um... Take the skin off. You skin the baby? You take the baby's skin off? Do you feel remorse? Have you told the police? I had to do what I had to do, or I'd be killed like like the babies that, that, they, that they made me watch killed, and that they put in my hand. They said, obey, or this is you. Jackie, you have some pictures drawn during the therapy sessions by the people who've been through this. Why don't you show me some of them? This picture is a person remembering skinning uh, children and babies and hanging it out to dry. And children skinning. skinning them, taking the skin off alive while they, while they are alive and uh, skin them until they die. And that's how your babies died? They took a little patch about three by four off of her stomach, skinned her, and said, we'll skin you all the way if you talk or cry. You learn not to cry real fast. I don't cry. For their part, mainstream Satanists strongly deny these gruesome allegations. Zena is the daughter of Anton LaVey, founder of the modern-day Church of Satan. And that's a popular misconception, too, is that children are sacrificed at the altar, or that uh, animals are used for uh, sacrifices. And it's a horrible, horrible misconception. This is real hard for the police because they can never find proof, and that's because the bodies are sometimes consumed for communion, um, sometimes burnt, sometimes put in concrete. For proof, the women offered a few grisly photos. But as the Satanists are quick to point out, the images of death and decay are impossible to verify. These middle-class housewives that are worried that we want to abduct their children are barking at the wrong tree because we wouldn't want anything to do with their whole mediocre and corrupt lifestyle. Because the charges are so bizarre, most mental health professionals distance themselves from the entire area of Satanism. But here in Denver, Colorado, the Bethesda Psychiatric Institute has become the first in the country to devote an entire department to treating the victims of ritual crime. Um, Can we believe these stories of sacrifice? 
I believe we need to believe them. Uh, they sound bizarre. They, they sound uh, beyond the capacity of human beings. Uh, but the stories we receive are tremendously consistent. Is this an epidemic? Uh, I believe uh, involvement in Satanism is increasing. Uh, I believe it is present in many communities around our country, and I believe it demands our attention. But somebody is apparently trying to discourage scrutiny. We've talked to therapists who treat ritual abuse victims, and they tell us of the threats they've received. I have direct knowledge of both death threats on a therapist and an attempt to end that therapist's life, which was unsuccessful. Here in Chicago, a group of well-known therapists from all over the country had the courage to share horror stories of threats and intimidation. Therapists have been directly threatened in ways that are quite alarming to them. A patient indicated to me that she wished to sacrifice the child with which she was pregnant. Naturally, I wasn't too enthusiastic about this. Uh, shortly after this uh, occurred, I start, started to get telephone death threats. One of the things that I would add is that we are now hearing these reports from literally hundreds of therapists in every part of the United States. Someone out there is telling us to back off. Still the greatest toll seems to be on the women who say that they have bred babies. Babies that were sacrificed for Satan. I will probably have nightmares tonight about it. As I have about my Joey that I have been talking about, I wake up screaming for him now in the middle of the night. I dream that he's lost and I'm trying to find him. Sickening, so incredibly outrageous, so incredibly unbelievable. But Zena LaVey, are these women lying? You have to understand that everything, every single thing you've um, given as examples of Satanism here are completely from a Christian standpoint that everything you've um, put forth as being considered satanic is not considered satanic by my standard or my Are definition these women of Satanism. Lying. Well, have the bodies been found? Where are they? Cheryl Horton, who joins us via satellite from Los Angeles. Cheryl Horton. Zena LaVey, a Satanist who A points out that this is not in keeping with Welcome. her teaching. But B says, where is the proof? Where is the proof? Why is there no proof if what you're saying is true? Hi, Geraldo. There's no proof for, for a fact of one thing. They burn the bodies. They either do that, they'll chop them up and dump them in the ocean, or they'll pour them in concrete, or they take and they use them for communion and eat them and then make bones out of the tools. Okay. Cheryl, listen. These the people stories, are doing listen, murders. Let me, let me interrupt you. Leave. Cheryl, please, okay. let me interrupt you. The stories dump in the ocean, chop up the bodies, these things, they sound like they can't be happening. Ted Gunnerson, respected law enforcement professional, recently or retired now from the FBI, former regional director of Los Angeles. Do you, sir, believe that these dreadful allegations of babies being sacrificed are true? I absolutely believe it, without any doubt. Based on the information that's been given to me, across the country by numerous survivors and by confidential sources and informants. Then why don't you name these people and arrest them? Never a name, never an arrest. These women come out of a group and they insist that they know the people in the group and yet they do not identify these large mysterious cults. Name them and arrest them and get them off the street. Does he not make a valid point? He makes a valid point. The problem with that is, number one, police officers don't believe it. I may believe it. You may believe it. Some people in your audience may believe it. They don't believe it. Number two, if you decide to investigate these people, you have to, number one, handle it from an undercover operation. If you put an undercover operation into effect, then you have, in a, in, in a sense, your own police officers become involved in these heinous crimes. And they are, of course, become murderers. And in addition to that, if you do, do decide to investigate these people, it's a, it's a lot of work. And many law enforcement officers are apathetic and uh, don't want to get involved. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard this. The debate here could rage over this issue alone for hours and hours and hours. Michael Aquino is right when he says there have not been any successful prosecutions for this horrible allegation. Ted Gunnerson is a, a sincere man with a good reputation who says that there are difficulties in the prosecution. 
Still, the point is it has never been proven in a court of law. Obviously, it needs more investigation, but if these things are happening, then there should be a national task force of federal and state and local cops working together to prove or disprove. Because this is just unacceptable, this impasse. Coming up, we're going to have warning signs you should watch for, parents, and all of our guests will be available for a final discussion about Satanism after this break. Father LeBar, from the point of view of the Catholic Church, is this something... Catholic parents, and I'm not singling out the Roman Catholic faith, obviously this affects children of all races, colors, creeds, religions. Uh, it seems uh, particularly strong, as you've seen over the course of the last two hours, to be uh, very strong in the so-called Bible Belt among fundamentalist Christians. But from the point of view of the Roman Catholic Church, is this something for parents to be concerned about? Something very much for parents to be concerned about, because in, in our Catholic theology we, re we know the power of the devil, we know the influence that the devil can have directly and indirectly. And whether you want to deny it as the Church of Satan people want to do or call it by another name, it doesn't matter. It's the power of evil, the force of evil, and it's that thing which disrupts ordinary human life, which as we've seen happening so often. So it is necessary for parents to beware. And be Dr. Careful. Aquino, is it the force of evil? Does it disrupt? Is it a force for everything negative? Well, if you're talking about Satanism as legitimate Satanists define it, absolutely not. It is ethical, it is above ground, it is positive. If you are talking about the devil as it is defined by religions such as Father Labar's, then it is, in fact, a symbol of degenerate behavior, and this is part of our problem. Tonight. Should we have warnings, sir, the way reasons. we do on cigarette packs for people coming into your houses of worship? Warning, this sect may be dangerous to your health and the health of the people you know. No, because in the case of the Temple of Set and the Church of Satan, we have not had any problems with criminal behavior. Among and yet other when things, you hear story after story after story of people committing these wretched crimes, these violent crimes in the devil's name, you find one common thread to that, that all these people that you've shown tonight come from a background in which their moral instruction has been from a religious tradition other than ours. It may be Father Labar's, it may be some other mainstream one, but it is not that of Satanism. Sean Sellers condemned to die by lethal injection because of the murder of your mother, your stepfather, and a convenience store clerk. You've heard the Satanist say that it is not the teaching that is wrong, it is the person that's wrong. Are you using Satanism as a cover for your violence? No, I'm not. I've heard quite a few while I can call them as lies on the show right now, I've heard uh, Dr. Aquino say that uh, Satanism is not, or the ideals that we're talking about here are not Satanism. That is because Satanists believe that good is evil and evil is good. And so, of course, they're not the ideals that he believes in. He believes that evil is good. That is what I believed in. I heard him say that the uh, uh, Satanic Bible is not to be taken literally. But I talked to a 16-year-old boy yesterday who takes the Satanic Bible literally. I've been working with a lot of ministries around the uh, United States trying to get and help people get out of the occult. He takes the Satanic Bible literally. I took it literally. A lot of people are taking the Satanic Bible literally. And um, I heard um, Anton LaVey's daughter say that uh, these um, babies who are being sacrificed, you know, they're, it's not Satanism. Or she wouldn't answer to saying that it was. The fact of the matter is that kids are abducted, teenagers are drawn into the occult, and a lot of them are being used for uh, occult um, sacrifices. And there's been so much on the show that you've, so, you've shown so much pain and blood and all this other gore and stuff, but you really haven't shown how to get out of the occult for those who want to get out. There is, um, let me tell you a story about a friend of mine. She tell it briefly, she, Sean, go ahead. Uh, just give me one half minute. Go ahead. Her name is, um, yeah, well, anyway, she works with the uh, Watch Network in uh, Texas, and she told me that a lady called her and said, my daughter's involved in Satanism, and I want her to get out, but I don't want her to become some kind of Jesus freak or anything like that. Sue told her, I'm sorry, I can't help you. A month later, the girl was uh, living with her aunt and uncle because her mother was in an insane asylum, 
and she was threatening to kill her aunt and uncle. What's your point, her, Sean? She destroyed three lives, her mother's, herself, and her aunt and uncle's because she didn't want her, her mother didn't want her to become a Jesus freak. I want to tell you right now, there is no other way out of Satanism except through Jesus Christ. Do you believe That's in the it. devil to this day? I believe in the devil, but I don't worship the devil. I'm a Christian. I stand up boldly and proudly and proclaim my faith in Jesus. Susan I'm telling you, there is no way out of Satanism except through Christ. Did, do you, do you feel a sense of frustration that people don't believe you when you talk about what happened to your daughter? Yes, I do. Uh, the problem with this whole, the problem with this whole issue is that the, because the crimes are so heinous, that people don't want to believe that an adult would do this to a, a child. And I don't know about the Church of Satan or the Temple of Set. I can't say that they had anything to do with what happened to my child. But if you look at a child's behavior, a child who's been ritually abused, there is no way that you can say that these things that they're talking about didn't happen to them. From the nightmares, to the running around the room when they disclose, to the latching on, to the crying and saying, Mommy, 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 don't go out, because if you go out, they're going to kill you. Threats, intimidation, fear. That's how this happened to my child and children all across the country. And it may have nothing to do with Dr. Aquino or Miss LeVay. All I know is what's happening to kids all over the country. They're being ritually abused. I don't know who's behind it, but it's happening. And parents have to be aware that children are not lying. Police officers have to listen to children. Listen to what they're saying and look at their behavior. Because a child cannot talk like you and I, who's been ritually abused. We'll be right back. All of us know that life is not safe. Every day we face the possibility of crime and disease and accidents and disasters. So here comes Satanism, which most of us would like to write off as harmless antics by some lunatic fringe. A few years ago maybe, but not now. We have seen that Satanism can be linked to dope and to pornography, child abuse and to murder. It has led seemingly normal teenagers into monstrous behavior. They preach mysticism. Other people, however, practice evil, and that is why we brought you this report tonight. I'd like to thank all of our guests, especially those we did not have a chance to get to. I'm Geraldo Rivera, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. I wish I...
Four people have been convicted of being part of a satanic sex cult in West Wales, whose activities included sexual acts with children and rape. Swansea Crown Court was told that Colin Batley, who was 48, set himself up as a high priest of the cult and modelled himself on the infamous occult practitioner Alistair Crowley, who called himself the Beast. He died in the 1940s. Tom Singleton of Radio Wales has followed the case throughout over several weeks. A distressing case, Tom. Just give us an outline as to uh, what led to the downfall of these people. Uh, well, Jim, this was a group of uh, four people. Colin Batley, uh, who just mentioned his wife, uh, Elaine, and two other women, uh, their neighbours Jacqueline Marling and Shelley Miller. They lived in adjoining properties on the same cul-de-sac in Kidwelly, uh, which is a quiet town on the coast in Carmarthenshire. What emerged over the four weeks that that group was on trial is in that pretty unassuming location, this group formed a satanic cult, uh, which had Mr. Batley at its head. As a cult, over a period of 15 years, they were responsible for a horrendous catalogue of sexual abuse against children and young adults, including many instances of rape. They had multiple victims, one a boy as young as six. Over the course of the trial, those victims gave harrowing accounts of what happened to them, and it was those victims coming forward, Jim, that brought, uh, brought this cult down in the end. What all of them said was that it was the group's occult beliefs and occult practices that was used to justify what was being done to them, in particular, uh, the Book of the Law, uh, a text by the occult writer that you mentioned, Alistair Crowley. Now, uh, as I say, he was born in the 1870s and, and lived through to the 1940s and was a pretty infamous figure. I mean, what, what were the sort of ideas, if we can call them that, were, that were adopted by Batley and his, uh, well, the people who turned out to be his co-defendants in this case? Uh, well, Jim, when the police searched the homes of Batley and all the other cult members, they found laminated copies uh, of Crowley's text in each of, the, in each of their homes. Uh, prosecutors in this case highlighted sections of his writings, which they said stated that sex with anyone uh, was to be encouraged, as was rape. And they said that this group, and in particular Batley, put that idea into practice. Uh, they said it also helped Batley establish his authority over the other cult members and intimidate his victims. Uh, those victims spoke of feeling brainwashed by Batley and said that he threatened them with punishments derived from uh, those occult beliefs, threats that at the time to them seemed credible. Uh, but it was just one of the ideas of the occult with which this group was obviously obsessed. The women uh, all had matching tattoos with Egyptian-style iconography uh, and the group would also... Uh, hold uh, occult rituals where the uh, abuse of these victims would often take place. Just a quick one, finally, Tom. I mean, what has been the reaction to the revelations in Kidwelly and the area in West Wales where all this occurred? Well, well, understandably, Jim, there's a sense of shock there. You know, what else could there be uh, at something so horrendous happening in their midst and over such a long period of time as well? People there have spoken to me about wanting to move on from this. Uh, easier said than done, perhaps. The real fear there, though, is that Kidwelly, which is um, an otherwise fairly unremarkable, if pleasant enough, provincial town, uh, it will become synonymous with this cult and the awful, awful things that they've done. Uh, Tom Singleton, uh, thank you very much indeed. You've been following this case. We can have a word with Paul Newman, who's a biographer of Alistair Crowley. A lot of people, uh, Paul Newman, will know the name and they, they might know the sobriquet, the beast, and so on. Uh, just remind us what his, his power was over those who followed him. Um, well, he was born um, in 1875, he was a Victorian, and his parents were Plymouth Brethren, who were very strict, and so he knew the Bible almost off by heart, and he identified with the Antichrist figure, and he saw that the one sin was restriction, and of course in Victorian England, it was in the area of sexual behaviour where people felt most restricted. So that's what he, he recoiled against? Well, mostly. yes, and he thought that sexual health was necessary. You should express yourself, and the body was sort of self-regulating. What he didn't allow for is limitary lines and boundaries. And, of course, any advocate of sexual freedom, I mean, he wasn't the only one, um, D.H. Lawrence, mm. um, Bertrand Russell tried to... All this point, you all always come up against this. And so, you know, it's the same problem, very active today, because um, sex has many kind of ugly heads. And the idea probably that 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 it'll find a natural balance, no doubt some people, it will in some people, but it, it, sometimes it masters the personality and um, ends mean, up in dreadful cases like when you've mentioned. Indeed. And what's interesting about Crowley is that he has become, and no doubt still does, and judging by this case, um, an obsessive figure for people. I mean, they become 
uh, absolutely riveted by by his peculiarities, by his dominating personal, personality, by his weirdness, by everything about him. Yes, well, I think when you find very unorthodox people, they tell you about the orthodoxy of society, and often you can study social dynamics through eccentrics. And, of course, um, Crowley shocked in many ways. Sometimes he was a kind of playful figure who was colourfully dressing up. Sometimes he was a mountaineer and explorer. So he was a trickster and he had many faces. He probably did not intend to um, willfully destroy people's lives, but he was like a, a supernova personality, a big, powerful, slightly kind of bloated influence who would draw smaller planets in and sometimes burn them up. He had intelligence and ability and he had a certain social standing, but he could be very dangerous to weaker people who were drawn into his to becoming disciples. this evening getting under the skin of the Ivy League, those eight old, definitely distinguished colleges that are known for their ivy-covered buildings and their sometimes superior attitudes to other colleges and universities, which often gets under the skin of people who went elsewhere. Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses, which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. Their prestige and importance have largely evaporated, but the rituals are still a secret. 
And so when we heard that some enterprising characters had managed to spy on the famous Skull and Bone Society, well, we couldn't resist. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. They're sort of trying to scare the initiates, make them, uh, you know, disorient them, frighten them. New York Observer investigative reporter Ron Rosenbaum accompanied a team of Yale students who shot these pictures nine days ago. Rosenbaum's curiosity about skull and bones was permanently piqued when, as a classmate of George W. Bush, he lived right next to the tomb, the group's heavily fortified home. From their perch, Rosenbaum and his cohorts taped the tomb's courtyard. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull, then members performing a mock killing. It may look like your average fraternity nonsense, but Rosenbaum says it's not. Even though it may seem silly to us, it seems to mean something to them, and you can't argue with the success of Skull and Bones. True. Famous alums include senators, John Kerry and John Chafee, to name two, cabinet secretaries, such as Averill Harriman, and three presidents, William Taft, George Bush, and George W. Bush, who's been reluctant to talk about Skull and Bones. Does it still exist? Um, the thing is so secret, I'm not even sure it still exists. In recent years, by many accounts, the on-campus influence and allure of Skull and Bones has waned dramatically. And there is no proof that the rituals recently caught on videotape are the same ones performed by the current president. Still, Rosenbaum says the tape is a valuable artifact, an extremely rare view into the secret society that groomed the American ruling class for generations. Dan Harris, ABC News. New York. That's our report on World News Tonight. Don't forget Nightline. And the society is shown here in 1993, reenacting the laying of the cornerstone for the United States Capitol on the 200th anniversary of the event. Know all of you who hear me, we proclaim ourselves free and lawful Masons, true to the laws of our country professing to revere God and to confer benefits upon mankind. This is the ceremony in which Senator Strom Thurmond, himself a 33rd degree Mason, took part. Senator Thurmond, we would like you to join in this. Since the William Morgan incident in 1826, when Americans uncovered a secret cabal working inside the government, the presence of Masonry in places of power has always sparked debate. But their influence in American government is undeniable. This is the same Bible upon which Presidents Clinton, Bush, Carter, and George Washington were inaugurated president. Of America's 43 presidents, at least 15 are confirmed Masons, though some say the number is even greater. In addition to the Capitol, the Freemasons have laid the cornerstone for every major building in Washington, D.C. The cornerstones of the President's House, known to us as the White House, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, incidentally by past Grand Master Benjamin Franklin, and Constitution Hall, stand out among many others as outstanding examples of cornerstones which have been laid Masonically. The cornerstone of the United States Capitol, however, stands out above all buildings erected in the free world as the seat of government for our people. This bronze plaque, located inside the U.S. Capitol, marks the spot where the original cornerstone was laid by George Washington, the first American president and a Freemason. George Washington is probably the most famous Mason in the world. The George Washington Masonic Memorial is entirely dedicated to the idea of Washington as a Freemason. Now, we do know that uh, Washington uh, participated in the laying of the cornerstone of the United States Capitol 
as a Masonic ceremony, and he wore his regalia as a master mason. And he laid the cornerstone and performed the ceremony of laying the cornerstone. Washington's participation in the event was recorded by the newspaper of the time, the Columbian Mirror, which can still be obtained through the Library of Congress. Laying the cornerstones of buildings which serve mankind is one of the world's most ancient customs. The cornerstone laying ceremony predates Freemasonry, um, although its early uh, symbolic purposes uh, as a as a sacrifice to appease the gods uh, or, or demons or whatever uh, in prehistorical times. Of course, there's no application to why Freemasons do it. The corn, wine, and oil that we, uh, that we use for this are, are also ancient symbols. Corn is the symbol of plenty, wine the symbol of refreshment, and oil the symbol of joy and gladness. While masonry maintains these symbols as a representation of blessing, there are some who believe they hold a more hidden meaning. With symbols, there are always multiple levels, up to seven different levels of interpretation with every particular symbol. Corn is an important symbol in masonry and is one found repeatedly in Washington, D.C. But what sort of hidden meaning could apply to corn?